Ah, the golden age. Perhaps the greatest decade for heavyweights in boxing history. Perhaps. The 1960s has seen majority domination by the undefeated, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, the ring's fighter of the decade, Muhammad Ali. But he'd been forced into exile after he refused to fight in the Vietnam War. Ali's undisputed title was split up, and in his absence, the WBA issued an eight-man tournament to decide who would be world champion. Joe Frazier boycotted the tournament on the grounds that his superior ranking rendered any bout against lower-ranked competitors unnecessary. Jimmy Ellis, who was an old companion of Ali's, would end up winning this tournament and the title, while Joe Frazier would take down Buster Mathis Sr. for the New York State Athletic Commission's championship. Now I should clarify, the title was state jurisdiction based, with Ellis recognized in 44 states and Frazier in only 6. Even so, Frazier's recognition carried more prestige as New York was prime time for heavyweight boxing. In 1967, radio producer Mary Warner had the brilliant idea to do a fantasy matchup to find the best heavyweight champion of all time. A bracket was conceived of which Muhammad Ali, Rocky Marciano, Joe Lewis, and Jersey Joe Walcott were included. Ultimately, Marciano won the entire tournament and was gifted a legitimate gold and diamond championship belt worth $10,000. Ali was furious that he was eliminated in the second round at the hands of Jim Jeffries, whom he deemed to be history's clumsiest and slow-footed fighter. He filed a lawsuit of defamation of character. The suit was settled when Warner offered to pay Ali $10,000 and to stage a super fight between he and Marciano, of which the winner would be decided by a computer. In February of 1969, Ali and Marciano boxed 70 to 75 rounds in a studio in Miami for the bout. Rocky lost 50 pounds and wore a toupee to appear as close as he could to his prime. On January 20th, 1970, 1,500 theaters across the United States, Canada, and Europe witnessed the results of the NCR 315 computer. The results differed depending on where it was aired. America and Canada saw Marciano knock Ali out in the 13th round, while Europe saw Ali knock Marciano out, also in the 13th round. Ali filed another lawsuit for defamation of character over the grounds that the film was promoted as a legitimate fight and not staged. He withdrew the lawsuit after seeing the European version. Unfortunately. Three weeks after filming finished, Rocky Marciano died in a plane crash on the eve of his 46th birthday. He never got to see the results of the fantasy bout, but he and Ali left the studio on good terms. For years, the event was in limbo, seeing random airings on TV and allegedly being destroyed. That was until December 27, 2005 in which the super fight was released on DVD along with a documentary on the film, archival footage, audio of the original radio fantasy fights, and more features. It has also been televised. It's also worth noting that the super fight inspired Rocky Balboa, the sixth film in the Rocky franchise, being featured as a plot device to get Rocky out of retirement. On the undercard of the heavyweight unification bout, 
the young lion rising contender in 1968 Olympic champion with only 15 fights, Big George Foreman took on experienced journeyman Gregorio Peralta. The fight went the distance showing that the imposing Foreman wasn't as invincible as his knockout percentage asserted. The decision, however, drew ire from the crowd, who felt that Peralta, at the very least, deserved a better nod score-wise from the judges, who'd all scored the fight overwhelmingly in favor of George Foreman. George secured the unanimous decision, but not without suffering a cut over his right eye. Peralta was cheered as he exited the ring. Muhammad Ali also reportedly studied this fight for his own match with Foreman four years later. It had been almost three years since the heavyweight title was in one piece, the night Muhammad Ali stopped Zora Foley in seven rounds. The title was divided soon after with Ali's suspension and it would take some time to agree to unification. On December 29, 1969, Joe Frazier and Jimmy Ellis finally reached a deal to fight for unification after petty disputes led the two to exhaust their remaining competition. Two weeks before the bout, Muhammad Ali surrendered the lineage by announcing his retirement for the sake of a new champion being formally acknowledged. It allowed heavyweight boxing to finally move on without him. Timing sure is a poochie. It was clear to all observers that the two men were on a collision course, one that would see fulfillment on February 16th at Madison Square Garden in New York City, New York. This bout would see Joe Frazier become the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world unifying the WBA and the now WBC titles when Angelo Dundee stopped the fight between rounds after Joe had battered and knocked down Ellis twice in the fifth round. There was now only one obstacle in the way of smoking Joe Frazier from holding heavyweight supremacy, the lineal champion. To some, the true champion. The man who'd never lost his crown to begin with and who was soon to return from his forced exile. The greatest, Muhammad Ali. Frazier had beaten one Dundee trained fighter. Now could he beat his best? The answer would come one year later in what may be the greatest fight of all time. The Bellflower Bomber, Jerry Quarry, a notable contender from the 60s who fought for the different versions of the title, continued his bounce back since losing by knockout to similar standing contender George Shavalo. His victim by six round knockout was undefeated Mac Foster. Quarry had fought most of the best the 60s had to offer and was on his way to fighting the man who was the absolute best of the 60s in four months time. On June 29th at the Armory in Jersey City, New Jersey, Charles Sonny Liston would square off against the real life Rocky, the band bleeder Chuck Webner. The bout would see Webner get some decent shots in, but ultimately face a difficult night as Liston opened him up and made his face a crimson mask. Liston knocked Webner down in the fifth round before winning the fight in the ninth when it was stopped on cuts by a ringside doctor. It isn't talked about much, but Sonny Liston was forging his own path back to the heavyweight championship. Outside of a fluke knockout loss in 1969, Liston was undefeated since his two losses to Muhammad Ali. Imagine if Liston had gotten his shot for the title against Smoke and Joe with Ali on the horizon. Unfortunately, this would never come to be as tragedy would rob us of this pipe dream. On August 4th, also at Madison Square Garden, 
The young 1968 Olympic gold medalist and soon-to-be master knockout artist, Big George Foreman, would square off against arguably the greatest chin in boxing history, Boom Boom George Shavalo. The Battle of the Georges was competitive enough in the first two rounds, with Foreman lashing out with wild punches and Shavalo digging into the body. Shavalo's left eye was already beginning to swell, and in the third round toward the end, Foreman would begin a series of battering ram barrages on Shavalo. Shavalo even staggered at one point, but never did he appear to be on his way down, or at least he himself thought as much. Foreman never let up, beating Shavalo, who wasn't throwing much back, in his own corner, and the fight would be stopped by referee Arthur McCanty by way of third round technical knockout. Chavalo insists to this day that the fight was stopped too soon and thinks he would have gassed Foreman and knocked him out as the fight went on. Given what would happen four years later in Zaire, he just may have had a point. The gentleman of boxing, Floyd Patterson, returned from a two-year layoff. It was almost two years to the day, just one day too late, since Floyd had dropped the WBA title bout decision to Jimmy Ellis. A year before that, Patterson was eliminated from the WBA Eliminator Tournament after two close wars with Jerry Quarry. In the present, Floyd secured a 10th round knockout over Charlie Devil Green. The bout is notable for the impromptu brawl that broke out after the bell rung to end round four. Also, Patterson went to help Green up after the knockdown, thinking his opponent had slipped. It had been three and a half years since Muhammad Ali last competed in his typical dominant style win, then over Zora Foley. Following the bout, he was stripped of his title for his refusal to be drafted into the Vietnam War, and regaining his license to box would prove to be his greatest challenge thus far far greater than any challenger had been up to that point. It almost happened in California, but then Governor Ronald Reagan blocked this stating that a draft dodger would get no such chance in the Golden State. It's ironic considering Ali would endorse Reagan years later and the two got on pretty well. Atlanta would end up being the hot spot as then Governor Lester Maddox had no such power to overrule the city's decision. Ali regained his license on August 12th of 1970 and would be back in the ring just one month later on October 26th at Atlanta City Auditorium against high-ranked contender, Irish Jerry Quarry. Ali's return would mark the City Auditorium as a haven for black power on this night. As for the fight, whether or not Ali was right to justify himself as the true champion was still on the line. For the most part, Ali was looking pretty good, even dancing Quarry around the ring but he was getting caught by a game quarry from time to time. It may not have been clear to those who were in awe of his return that night, but looking back, it's clear as day Ali's supernatural talents had eroded a fair bit in his three and a half years away from the sweet science. If it wasn't clear in this fight or in his next against Oscar Bonavina, it would certainly become clear in the fight of the century. Ali won the fight by technical knockout after a cut he'd opened up over Quarry's eye in the third round proved too much for the inside of referee Tony Perez between rounds. Ali had proven himself by returning against a high-ranked and experienced contender with this win over the Bellflower Bomber and was one step closer to a traditional unification bout against smoking Joe Frazier. On November 18th, did rising young lion Big George Foreman decimate Boone Kirkman in the second round after two knockdowns. Most notable was Foreman storming out of his corner at the opening bell and straight up shoving Kirkman to the ground. It gets a good laugh out of me every time without fail. Also on November 18th at Cobo Arena in Detroit, Michigan, Smokin' Joe Frazier would make the first defense of his near undisputed title against the reigning light heavyweight champion, the deputy sheriff, Bob Foster. Foster had grown curious of what was above him and ventured into the realm of the big dogs. 
it wasn't pretty. For Foster, that is. Whereas we know the great success stories like Evander Holyfield, Michael Spinks, and Ezra Charles, all former lower weight class champs who took the leap to heavyweight success, Bob Foster was unfortunate in his leap. Foster took the boxer's approach to Smokin' Joe, but to no avail, as the pressure was just too much. Frazier got Foster out of there quick, stopping him in two rounds. The first knockdown was a bomb of a left hook that sent Foster back and down. He would answer the count, but eat an even worse dynamite left hook that would end his night. That shot from Frazier sent Foster to the canvas via the ropes first as he brushed him on his way down. Light work for the world champion, and he too was now one step closer to answering the question everyone had. Who's the true, undefeated, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world? In the last important bout of 1970, Muhammad Ali squared off against a man known as Ringo, Oscar Bonavina. The bout took place on December 7th at Madison Square Garden and would serve as a more telling image of how Ali's skills that he wrote it during his layoff. Ali was up against a tough customer in Ringo and the fact that he'd chosen to face him so soon into his comeback speaks volumes on the greatest competitive spirit. Bonavina had gone to war twice with Smoke and Joe back in the 60s, the man Ali was gunning for to regain the title he'd never lost. In their first fight, Oscar dropped Joe twice in the second round before Frazier rallied back to capture a split decision win. Their second fight was a grueling 15 round unanimous decision win for Frazier that saw Bonavina gain the respect of the boxing world. It's clear what narrative Ali was building by choosing to face Bonavina. Oscar spent the pre-fight taunting Ali by calling him a coward who dodged the draft and consistently jabbing at him by calling him Clay. Of course, Ali was ready to punish Bonavina as he'd done to Floyd Patterson and Ernie Terrell before. The fight was one-sided, but not in previous Ali fashion. Ali was outlanding Bonavina while taking some blows himself. This was a new Ali who was willing to stand flat and exchange blows, also showing that he had an elite chin in his own right. The decisive round would be the very last one, in which Ali stopped Oscar by three knockdown wounds. Ringo had never been stopped before, and he'd never be stopped again. Anyone who was expecting to see the hit without getting hit Ali experienced their first rude awakening. The second would come in March of the next year. December 30th of 1970 was an interesting day for the world of boxing. On one hand, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier reached a deal to fight in March to crown the true undisputed champ. Both men were undefeated and held a legitimate claim to the lineage, the ring magazine's title, and the alphabet titles. Ali had two tune-up bouts, and Frazier was rolling as champ. There had been an interesting war of words across the media between the two dating back to the late 60s. Behind the scenes, however, Joe Frazier had been there as a brother for Ali in dark times for the exiled champ. Perhaps Joe felt betrayed at how vicious Ali was towards him in the press. Smoke and Joe dared to lash out at Ali in the way that always worked to get him worked up. He called him Cassius Clay. Ali notoriously tortured the three men who had done this before, Patterson, Terrell, and Bonafina. Would Joe Frazier suffer the same fate? The time was right to settle who the best man really was. Now on the other hand, this day will live in infamy for the mysterious case of Charles Sonny Liston's death. He was found dead by his widow, and the questions still remain today on how he died. Was it a drug overdose, heart failure, a hit by the mob? Imagine the dream matches we could have had with Sonny surviving and going forward on his trek toward the title throughout the 70s. He was gunning for Frazier already. There may have been a third Ali fight. He may have collided with his former sparring partner, George Foreman, and so much more that we'll never get to see. Liston and all those he knew took most of what they knew of the former champ to their graves.
the world will never truly know what happened. But we do know that he was a great champion and that he will live forever in the hearts of boxing fans worldwide. At the end of 1970, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. 1970 flipped the script from the up and down 1960s. Joe Frazier was the alphabet man, and Muhammad Ali was finally back. They were the last remaining question as the division finally looked to be back on its way to unification. Jerry Quarry snatching Mac Foster's O is taking upset of the year. Quarry had built himself into a contender you could miss, making the work of Muhammad Ali all the more impressive on the year. The ring's round of the year was round 15 of the Ali-Bonavina matchup. Ali was the only man to stop Bonavina and did so in dramatic fashion via three knockdown rule. He was looking better and better on his road back to the title. No heavyweight bout won fight of the year, but if one had to be chosen, it'd have to be the bout between Joe Frazier and Jimmy Ellis, where Frazier unified the alphabet titles in dominant fashion en route to the fight of the century. Ali Bonavina comes close with his dramatic finish, but Frazier was a man on a mission and was running the show in 1970. Logically, the ring's fighter of the year was the champion, Smokin' Joe Frazier. Joe had a great 1970, and the next year would be even greater for the champ. On January 10th, Oscar Bonavina, continuing his active schedule from the 60s, opened the decade in a disqualification loss. On January 26th, George Foreman scored a fifth-round knockout over future Superman movie star Jack O'Halloran. The win earned him the match against Gregorio Peralta on the Frazier Ellis undercard. On March 24th, Henry Cooper won a unanimous decision over Jack Bodell. On April 17th, George Foreman stopped James J. Woody in three rounds, referee Johnny Colon stepping in having seen enough of Foreman's one-sided destruction. Ken Norton was featured in Ring Magazine as one of the five young lions to look out for. He'd won seven of his eight fights that year and had also sparred with both Ali and Frazier. Another among the five young lions, Olympic champion George Foreman, was on a tear, having knocked out 11 of his 12 victims in the year. His record was up to 25-0 with 22 knockouts and he was gaining momentum as a definitive rising star amongst heavyweights punctuated by his TKO win over contender George Chivalo. Joe Bugner was another of the five Lions and had spent the summer of 1970 sparring with Ali, Frazier, Ellis, and Liston. He also scored a win over Chuck Wepner in September. Overall, 1970 was looking to be a resurgence year for the heavyweight division as not only was Muhammad Ali back, but the division as a whole was back, following the slump that occurred at Ali's exile in 1967. The career of the mysterious Big Bear, Sonny Liston, was puzzling. The organized crime that got him off the ground to fight would come back to derail him later. His journey to the world title saw him lose only once in a fight that he probably would have won had he not been horsing around. Liston also beat Cleveland Big Cat Williams twice in what may be two of his finest performances. That is, until you get to Liston's bouts with the champion Floyd Patterson. Liston dominated Patterson twice and looked invincible. After years of being ducked with the title that eluded him, Sonny Liston was finally the heavyweight champion of the world. But this all came crashing down when he met the young rising contender Cassius Clay. Liston lost both bouts to the man who would become Muhammad Ali and continued on the comeback trail until his untimely death 
1970 after having last thrashed Chuck Wepner. Liston also talked up about with the champion Joe Frazier, stating how it'd be like shooting fish in a barrel. Judging by the destruction of Frazier at the hands of Liston's sparring partner George Foreman years later, Liston may have been correct in his assessment of a potential bout with Smoke and Joe. On January 9th of 1971, people of all walks of life gathered to remember the life of the fallen champion, Charles Sonny Liston. Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Robinson, and Joe Lewis were among the legendary champions in attendance. Sonny's widow, Geraldine, infamously exclaimed while lingering over her husband's coffin, What happened to you, Sonny? Liston's career ended with a record of 50 wins, 4 losses, and 0 draws. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1991. We can only wonder, how would Sonny Liston have affected the heavyweight scene of the 70s on his comeback trail? Imagine a third match against the eroded Ali, and matches against Frazier, Foreman, Norton, Shavers, Holmes, and more. Alas, it wasn't meant to be. Rest in peace to the man who may be the most devastating and feared force in boxing history. Muhammad Ali finally got the fight he'd hunger for, about against smoking Joe Frazier. But perhaps it was Frazier who'd hungered for this bout even more. Both men had a legitimate claim to the lineage and the title, being undefeated and undisputed in their own right. They were also Olympic gold medalists, Ali from 1960 and Frazier from 1964. This fight took center stage seeing celebrities and public figures from around all walks of life gather to witness the fight of the century. Ali had spent the build-up to the fight verbally hammering away at Joe, and Frazier didn't find his antics as funny as some others would. The night of the fight, we'd see how Joe really felt when the undisputed title was up for grabs. For 15 long, painful rounds, the two men would beat and batter one another, much to the delight of the crowd and all onlookers around the world and across time. Ali took a new initiative in this fight, choosing to stand flat-footed in exchange with Smoke and Joe, and he was teeing off on the champ. But strangely enough, this would ultimately prove his downfall, as Frazier's relentless pressure shots to the body, and cleaner blows that shook Ali would win him a unanimous decision. The decision was only sealed off by the knockdown in the 15th round. Joe Frazier had shocked and shook up the world in his own right. He had unified the titles that were splintered after Ali's exile, and he'd now beaten Ali to claim his right to the lineage and the Ring Magazine's championship. Joe Frazier was the heavyweight champion of the world in every facet, unopposed, undisputed, and unchecked. This fight definitely took some years off of the careers and lives of both men. Frazier would never reach this height of prominence again, using a lot of his career's proverbial tank here to beat the Louisville lip. Frazier remained in the hospital for weeks and understandably took the rest of the year off. Honestly, he could have retired after a win like that. Ali got the better of the night's exchange career-wise as it served as half of the wake-up call all grades need. He would fight three more times in the year and win them all while continuing to grow a celebrity around the world. All this despite him losing the fight of the century. Across the seas, Henry Cooper had his last bout when he faced off against Joe Buckner. 
The site, known in the modern day as Wembley Arena, was the perfect site for the British legend to hang up the gloves, and even in defeat, he had the heart of his people. Bugner's flurry in the 15th round may have secured him the decision. Ozzy Joe won the fight, but himself felt he never quite recovered from the backlash he received after narrowing out the win against our Henry. Unfortunately, I was unable to find any footage of the event, but its significance begs to be addressed. On May 10th at the Coliseum Arena in Oakland, California, Olympic champion George Foreman and Argentinian rival Gregorio Peralta engaged in a rematch of their controversial 1970 bout. The bout was for the NABF title that was vacated by Muhammad Ali so that he could face Joe Frazier. This time around, Foreman was out to right the wrong of the first bout. He opened a cut over Peralta's left eye in round three and staggered him in the seventh with two left hooks. In the tenth, the referee had seen enough as Foreman was battering Peralta who was leaning on the ropes after already taking a standing eight count. George Foreman shut down his critics with a big win here. Just four months after the fight of the century, while his rival took the rest of the year off to properly recover, Muhammad Ali returned to the ring to embark on his comeback against his friend and gym mate, Jimmy Ellis. The bout was for the vacant NABF heavyweight title as George Foreman had relinquished it. Ellis was coming off of a unanimous decision win over George Chavallo. That night in the Houston Astrodome, the Muhammad Ali that the world had come to know in the 1960s appeared to re-emerge. He was bouncy, stinging with his sharp shots and slipping blows. In the 12th round, Ali started banging away at Ellis with precise uppercuts, hooks, and straights. The referee would call a halt to the action, giving Ali the stoppage victory over his friend. It's also worth noting that Angelo Dundee, Ali's usual trainer, wasn't in his corner that night. Dundee made an agreement with Ali to train Ellis, whom he also normally trained and managed, as a means of getting a higher payday for the fight. Ali would go on to continue his march back to the title, and fans yearned for the rematch with Frazier, but would have to wait another two years, where the circumstances would be very different. In the venue that would come to be known as Wembley Arena, Joe Bugner suffered a setback when he was outpointed by Jack Buddell, completely whiffing an opportunity to stop his awkward opponent in the 12th round. The setback for Bugner would only be amplified less than two months later when Buddell took a step up in competition. Young Lion Big George Foreman made easy work of Luis Pire, the referee stepping in to stop the action before the fifth round could begin. Like most of Foreman's bouts at the time, it was ridiculously one-sided and a showcase of how dangerous this young man was in light of the heavyweight title picture. But surely, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier shouldn't be too worried, right? Jack Bedell made the aforementioned step up in opponent quality against the Bellflower Bomber, Jerry Quarry. Quarry knocked Bedell out in the first round and continued his march toward the heavyweight title, almost nonchalantly given how easily he trumped Bedell. To conclude 1971, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Peace and order in the form of unification is all a boxing fan wants. Joe Frazier had everything within his grasp after the fight of the century. It was now up to the would-be contenders of the era to step up and attempt to seize the throne. Muhammad Ali was back to square one and looked silly for saying he was the true champion. Years of all that talk, he'd better hope he can turn things around. Smokin' Joe Frazier 
answering all questions emphatically with his 15-round conquest over Muhammad Ali is the logical choice for upset of the year. Joe Frazier really was for real and the true heavyweight champion, silencing years of doubt that dated back to Ali's exile in 1967. All hail to the heavyweight king. The ring's round of the year was round 15 of Frazier Ali, where Smoke and Joe sealed off a masterful performance by knocking Ali down in the final round. The ring's fight of the year was Smoke and Joe Frazier versus Muhammad Ali in the fight of the century. The two men destroyed one another and began one another's countdown toward the end of their prominence much sooner than it had to start. The ring's fighter of the year was Smokin' Joe Frazier, who'd proven beyond any shadow of a doubt that he was the best heavyweight in the world and maybe even the best fighter in the world. A clean sweep of the awards for Smokin' Joe. On May 10th, Jimmy Ellis outpointed George Chevallo over 10 rounds. He was looking good in his post-unification run until he ran into Muhammad Ali in his next fight. On December 26th, Muhammad Ali stopped Jurgen Blinn in the seventh round. Muhammad Ali and Wilt Chamberlain were scheduled to have a match, but it fell through. Wilt was even trained by Custody Amato, the man who had trained Floyd Patterson and who would train Iron Mike Tyson. Funny enough, it was at a press conference that Wilt walked out and the fight was off and all because Ali hollered, Timber! The division as a whole was looking pretty stacked as past greats remained while up and coming greats were priming. Among the names were Cleveland Williams, Floyd Patterson, Oscar Bonavina, Jimmy Ellis, George Chavallo, Jerry Quarry, Henry Cooper. All of them were either still going or winding down. Ken Norton and Ernie Shapers earned some wins on the year, and Ron Lyle made his debut and was a literal smash success, knocking out nine of his 11 victims. Olympic champion Big George Foreman was emerging as the force we know him as today. He was ranked number two only behind Muhammad Ali with seven wins on the year, all knockouts, leaving him with a record of 32 and 0. A week after the fight of the century, the boxing news in Britain ran a front cover. The face that haunts the champ. That had Foreman giving one of his trademark intimidating glares. Frazier and Foreman wouldn't meet for another two years. But it was certainly building. And the collision course was on. In September of 1971, Don King was released from prison and would go on to corrupt the sport of boxing and entertainment as a whole even further with his sleazy business actions. Uh, uh, allegedly. On November 17th, Cleveland Williams was decisioned by George Chavallo in the Houston Astrodome. It was the undercard fight of the Muhammad Ali Buster Mathis Sr. bout in which Ali dominated Mathis and won easily on points. Perhaps the greatest fight there ever was headlined the year, but it was a thin year in the big picture. Still, don't take your eyes off that Foreman guy. There were good supporting bouts and, in hindsight, the fight of the century was the cornerstone of the excellent story that was unfolding. The story of the greatest stretch of the heavyweight championship there ever was. Again, all hailed the king, Joe Frazier. To open the year, the boxing world was blessed with the return of the undisputed, undefeated world champion, Joe Frazier. Frazier's time off was more than necessary to compensate for the beating he took in the fight of the century. He was hiding some serious eye damage from pre-fight medical staff and had to carefully choose the venue of his next fight. From this point in his career, Frazier's eyesight was at severe risk of going dark, and the man still continued to wage war in the division truly the heart of a lion. On January 15th at the Rivergate Auditorium in New Orleans, Louisiana, 
Joe Frazier would defend his undisputed title against ninth ranked contender and legal student Terry Daniels in a lopsided fourth round technical knockout. Frazier dropped Daniels in the first and dominated the action until the fourth. Joe Frazier was back and he was ready to continue defending what he'd proven without a shadow of a doubt was his, the undisputed championship. The window to the past, Floyd Patterson returned to the ring against the notable contender Oscar Bonavina. Patterson survived being dropped in the fourth and bullied in the eighth to secure the unanimous decision win. Bonavina thought he won, citing how he'd also knocked down champion Joe Frazier twice before and still lost. Patterson was proud of his honor as a fighter who always got up when knocked down. It's also worth noting that the fight was originally planned for November 19th of 1971, but Oscar suffered a broken left index finger, causing the postponement. In the first fight in Asia to feature two top 10 ranked heavyweights, Muhammad Ali scored a 15 round unanimous decision over Mac Foster. Disappointing when you realize Ali said he'd knock Foster out in five and even entered the fight with a ring card showcasing the fifth round. The comeback trail roared on for the Louisville Lip. On May 1st at the Pacific Coliseum in Vancouver, Canada, Muhammad Ali would engage in a rematch of their 1966 bout with Boom Boom George Chavalo. The fight was another unanimous decision for Ali, but is notable for Shivalo's comments after the fight. Shivalo stated that the Ali he'd fought that night wasn't the same man he fought six years earlier. He was slower and not as slick, but he was stronger. Ever rising young lion George Foreman stomped Miguel Angel Pies in just two rounds. There was some dirty play by Foreman, namely pushing and some lower aim blows, but he was not to be stopped and marched on. A little trivia before we move on. This was Miguel's only fight in the United States. He was the Argentinian heavyweight champ. The fight was a benefit for the Special Olympics, and the fight was postponed from April 24th because Miguel couldn't secure a visa in time to train for the bout. The undefeated, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world returned and battered Ron Stander so badly the challenger needed 32 stitches after the fact. Referee Zach Clayton stopped the fight before the fifth round could begin and what we already knew remained to be true. Shemokin Joe was the man. On June 27th at the convention center in Las Vegas, Nevada, Muhammad Ali continued his comeback trail in a rematch with Jerry Quarry. Whereas you could see the cracks in his armor the first time they met in 1970, this time was a showcase of Ali's reform. He had fallen well into his new role, accepting that the Ali of the 60s was gone. He was dancing, sticking, and dealing unreciprocated punishment to Quarry but that's not to say that Jerry wasn't showcasing his own toughness. The referee stopped the fight in the seventh with Ali waving goodbye to Quarry as the bout came to an end. After the fight, Ali called out Joe Frazier directly, insisting he was a bum and a coward for refusing to even talk with him in regards to a rematch. Ali asserted that he was very ready for Frazier again. George Foreman was ringside that night, and to further push the narrative, Ali called him over to tell him that Frazier was going to choose to face him over Ali himself because Frazier saw George as the easier matchup. Ali also insisted that George fight him over Frazier because of this. Foreman laughed it all off, had a shadow box off with Ali, and went about his night. The standoff between the two did begin the buzz for an Ali Foreman bout, but we wouldn't see this bout 
until 1974. Muhammad Ali continued his resurgence of contention against his former sparring partner, Al Blue Lewis. Ali downed Lewis in the fifth, to which Al answered at the count of nine, and the bell rang. But controversy surrounded the knockdown. Angelo Dundee complained that Lewis was down for 22 seconds. Either way, the ref counted painfully slow and prolonged the inevitable. The bout was stopped in the 11th, and Muhammad Ali continued on strong. On September 10th in Munich, Germany, Cuban amateur boxer Teofilo Stevenson wins his first Olympic gold medal, defeating Ion Alexei of Romania. Along the way to the gold, Stevenson defeated Dwayne Bobic, who would turn professional the next year in 1973. Rather than turn professional himself, Stevenson remained an amateur boxer and continued to grow his legacy as a national icon in Cuba. In the trials, Dwayne Bobbick outlasted Larry Holmes, dropping the future Big Black Cloud along the way. Interesting if you're familiar with how both of their professional careers went. It's also worth noting that Muhammad Ali and Howard Cosell co-commentated the event together. In what would be Patterson's last bout, Ali would stop him in seven rounds. Patterson wanted to continue, but the referee refused to allow the one-eyed fighter onward. The beating that Patterson endured wasn't of the same magnitude as the one in 1965 when he'd paid the price for referring to Ali as Cassius Clay. This time, the battle was between two men who respected one another, despite their still different outlooks on life. Floyd never announced his retirement, but this was the end of the road for the great champion. Patterson had served as a window of sorts for boxing. He was a boxer who'd fought men who were active in the 1930s and 40s, belonged to the 1950s himself, and fought through the 1960s and into the 1970s. With his retirement, the link to the black and white past of boxing was gone. The same thing would happen in 1997 when George Foreman retired after becoming a Floyd Patterson linking figure in his own right. 1977 would see an attempt to bring Patterson out of retirement for a third bout with Ali, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get to that. In one of the first bouts ever refereed by the legendary Mills Lane, Muhammad Ali took on light heavyweight champion Bob Foster. The event took place at the Sahara Tahoe Hotel in State Line, Nevada. Coming into the bout, Ali had Foster outweighed by 40 pounds. The fight saw Muhammad Ali suffer the first and only cut of his career at the hands of Bob Foster. That would be the only plus on Foster's night, as he was dropped a total of seven times in the bout. Four times in the fifth, twice in the seventh, and the final time in the eighth, in which Foster failed to beat the count. Muhammad Ali had retained the North American Boxing Federation title by eighth round stoppage over the man who may be the greatest light heavyweight of all time. At the end of 1972, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Much of the same this time around, Joe Frazier was the center of gravity for the division and Muhammad Ali was desperately clawing his way back to the top against every challenger. Young Lions, namely George Foreman, were making more noise too. The gentleman of boxing, Floyd Patterson, willing his victory over the aggressive and game Oscar Bonavina is our upset of the year. Good achievement as he would ride into his career sunset to end the year. The ring's round of the year was round five of the Ali Foster fight, 
around where Ali decked and dropped Foster four times. The heavyweight division didn't win fight of the year, but if we had to choose one, Ali Foster takes it. Watching Muhammad Ali drop a man seven times is hard to beat. Of course, the ring fighter of the year was Muhammad Ali. The comeback trail was looking mighty fine for the Louisville Lip. Buster Mathis Sr. had his final professional bout on September 29th against rising contender Ron Lyle. Lyle knocked out Mathis in the second round. Speaking of Lyle, he won all eight of his fights on the year and not a single one of them went the distance. He was flawless and heading into 1973 to test his merit as a pro against a step up in competition. Though everyone was buzzing for the rematch between Frazier and Ali, no one wanted it more than Ali himself. He called out Frazier on multiple occasions, one of which was to state how he'd been fighting like the devil in 71 and 72 while Frazier was easing his way back into the fight game. Ali's opponents had also been more impressive wins for him as opposed to the two Frazier had engaged. The high of the fight of the century was fading fast and the boxing world was ready for Ali and Frazier to get it on again. Ali fought six times on the year to keep the public's eye as a top heavyweight, but was still no closer to a rematch with Smoke and Joe. As was the case from 1967 to 1971, Ali would be left outside of the title picture, but this time he had his license. He just couldn't secure the bout with the champion. George Foreman won all five of his bouts by knockout on the year and had earned the right to the fight with Joe Frazier. In November of 1972, they had signed to fight in Jamaica, set for January of 1973, much to the ire of Muhammad Ali. On March 17th, Ken Norton won a unanimous decision win over Jack O'Halloran. Good win as Norton continued his rise of will toward greatness. The two were supposed to have a rematch in November, but O'Halloran pulled out due to tendonitis in his right elbow. Norton stopped substitute Henry Clark in nine rounds. While we're on the subject, Ken Norton had won all six of his bouts on the year as well and was heading into 1973 with the fuel he'd gained from reading Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. 73 would see Norton leave his mark on heavyweight history by being the second part of every wake-up call all greats need. Joe Bugner won his eight fights on the year. Like Foreman, he was on his way to challenging the top two heavyweights in Ali and Frazier. Muhammad Ali's brother Rockman, originally known as Rudy Clay, finished his eight-year career with a record of 14 wins, three losses, and one draw. Back in 1971, he lost on the undercard of the fight of the century. Man, that just wasn't the night for the Ali's. On May 11th, Cleveland Big Cat Williams had his last notable match when he beat Terry Daniels for the Texas Heavyweight Championship at the Dallas Memorial Auditorium by unanimous decision. He would have his last professional bout later that year on October 28th in Denver, Colorado. The division was looking as competitive and wide open as ever, and anyone could earn a chance at Joe Frazier's title. In conclusion, 72 was more so of a narrative building year in the wake of the great 1971. The division was, however, in store for a landmark year. In the first ever televised bout for HBO Boxing, what may be the second most prominent heavyweight bout of the 70s took place at National Stadium in Kingston, Jamaica. Undisputed, undefeated heavyweight champion Joe Frazier put it all on the line. The alphabet titles, the ring title, 
and the lineage against the number one challenger who had been lurking in the shadows since the fight of the century, Big George Foreman. It was a battle of the Olympic champions, Frazier the champion from 1964 and Foreman the champion from 1968. Frazier came into this bout with 10 consecutive title defenses, but he hadn't been too active since fighting Ali two years earlier. Foreman had an undefeated record of 37-0, almost doubling Frazier's undefeated record, which sat at 19-0. Frazier viewed George's record as being deceptive and felt he would be the one to overpower Big George. This could be the biggest miscalculation in boxing history. According to Eddie Futch, the atmosphere around Frazier was more that of a party than of a big fight something that was uncommon for the hardest working man in boxing, Joe Frazier. Butch also spoke of how Frazier was being handled in sparring by Ken Norton, something that was usually the opposite. All the signs were pointing to this being a real red flag for the champ, but still he pressed on. On fight night, the stare down in the ring told many stories. On Frazier's side, he was doing his usual gig, which had always netted him the confidence of the audience, but this time things were different. The look from George Foreman was one of a man looking through Joe Frazier. Funny enough, Foreman revealed years later that he was terrified and that if Joe had looked down, he would have seen how unstable George's legs were. The fight was an upset to say the least, with Foreman absolutely flooring Frazier. The fight started off interesting enough with the two men swinging for the fences. Frazier caught George with the left hook a few times, but to no avail. Foreman began to take advantage of his size and made adjustments around Frazier's over-aggressive smothering, the same smothering that neutralized Muhammad Ali. Foreman decked Frazier with every punch he could throw, ranging from his jab to straights to hooks to uppercuts. Frazier's first time down yielded the famous call from Howard Cosell. Down goes Frazier! Down goes Frazier! This would continue for all of two rounds until the referee stopped the bout after Frazier was bulldozed to the canvas six times. George Foreman had shook up the world and become the new undefeated, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. This shook up the division in a big way as Foreman appeared invincible and if Ali couldn't beat Frazier. How in the world would he beat Foreman? The world was about to get a prime lesson on how styles make fights, but not for another year and a half or so. The undefeated knockout sensation Ron Lyle stepped up and faced the notable Jerry Quarry. The inexperienced Lyle was unable to make the same work of Quarry that he'd made of 17 of his last 19 opponents, struggling to land big all fight. Actually, it was Corey who managed to land some nice shots that wobbled Lyle, though Corey was unable to finish Lyle off. The fight restored Corey's contendership, and Lyle got back to the drawing board, his O now belonging to the Bellflower Bomber. About seen as the kid against the old master took place on February 14th at the convention center in Las Vegas, Nevada, when Muhammad Ali continued his comeback tour against one of the young lions, Joe Bugner. Just 29 days earlier, Ali had attended one of Bugner's bouts and called him out after the fight. Seizing the opportunity, Bugner immediately accepted. The build-up to the fight saw Elvis Presley, one of Ali's idols growing up, present Ali with a specially made robe that was christened with the words, People's Champion. The fight was another unanimous decision win for the greatest. He cut Bugner in the first round and looked overall impressive as he danced well and stung Bugner with slick precision from the outside for 12 action-packed rounds. Bugner was no slouch and got some good shots in on Ali too. This fight isn't talked about enough for how well Ali looked on his comeback trail and lends a fair share of credibility to what would happen in Ali's next match in March against an unlikely conqueror. One of the most important fights of the decade, unbeknownst to everyone, would take place on March 31st at the Sports Arena in San Diego, California, 
when Muhammad Ali, ever strong in his comeback march toward the heavyweight title, would take on little-known rising contender and young lion, Ken Norton. Norton was a sparring partner of Ali's arch rival Joe Frazier and had Eddie Futch in his corner. He took this fight very serious and came in more prepared than he'd ever been for any fight before. Ali, meanwhile, showed little to no concern over Norton and came in ill-prepared. He suffered an ankle injury while playing golf and allegedly spent the night before the fight laid up with two women. Remember how Ali's loss to Frazier served as half of the wake-up call every great needs? Well, this was the second. Every fighter has their kryptonite, an opponent who serves as their perfect foil. Some would say that this was Frazier, but others would say that it was Ken Norton. The fight saw Norton use an awkward crab-like style to upset the rhythm of Ali as he executed Futch's game plan to perfection. Somewhere in the fight, Norton broke Ali's jaw, though the round it happened in is still up for debate. The fight was even enough to warrant the 12th round as the tiebreaker, and Norton would win this round and thus the fight by split decision, taking the NABF title off Ali. Ken Norton had established himself as a legitimate heavyweight contender with his shocking upset of a rejuvenated Muhammad Ali who was on a comeback trail of his own. This loss acted as the splinter road of Ali's career for whatever he did after this would shape his legacy forever. Many in the sporting world believe this was the beginning of the end for the once prominent champion Muhammad Ali. In an explosive first round affair, Ernie Shavers found himself reeling against former WBA champion Jimmy Ellis, but landed an evil uppercut that sent Ellis to the canvas. The shot was so mean, it had Ellis looking astounded as he sat up and vibrated from the force. There was a long face-off between the ref and Ellis before it was officially called off. Big win for the Streaky Shavers. It's also worth noting that this fight coming to be was a convoluted mess that involved Jerry Quarry and George Shavalo. While we're talking about the Black Destroyer, he stopped Jimmy Young earlier in the year and would draw with Young in the next year. No footage is currently available for either bout. Joe Frazier returned to the ring on July 2nd at Earl's Court Arena in London to take on young rising contender Joe Buckner. Buckner had just gone the distance with Ali five months earlier and had another chance to stake his claim to heavyweight legitimacy on this night. This was Frazier's first fight since his loss to Foreman in January, and he was looking to get back into the title picture in his own right. This fight wasn't for any title, yet its significance came in pride and a higher spot on the waiting list for the right to fight George Foreman. Speaking of the undisputed, undefeated champion, he was on commentary that night. The fight was an underrated blood fest with both men pounding one another. In the 10th, Frazier dropped Buckner and could have seriously hurt him, but Frazier's class shined through. The bout made it to the 12th and final round, which was a slugfest that saw the two men continue fighting after the bell. It was so loud in the venue that neither man heard the bell and they had to be separated at the fight's conclusion. The champion Big George saw the fight as a win for Joe Bugner, but the referee, who was the sole judge for the bout, saw the fight as a narrow win for Joe Frazier. Frazier's left eye had taken a serious beating from Bugner, almost completely closed. Remember that Frazier was already flirting with going blind. In the span of just five months, Joe Bugner went to hell against two of the best heavyweights of all time. He'd also effectively retired Henry Cooper. The man was certainly no bum. Yet, there was still an air of uncertainty around Bugner's legitimacy as a fighter. The fight with Frazier left Bugner sick for two months. He had bruised kidneys and liver, and he was peeing blood. The fight was the end of the year for both men. A bonus for you. Footage surfaced of the 1983 bout between Joe's son Marvis and Joe Bugner after I put together a timeline of the 1980s heavyweight boxing division. So, here we are. 
A month short of being 10 years after the Battle of the Joes, Marvis Frazier secured a unanimous decision win over Ozzie Joe. The win brought Frazier to 10-0, securing him a title bout against the super champion of the 80s five months later. Who is this champion? Well, you can find out in the 80s timeline linked below. I will tell you this. This champion made his pro debut here in 1973, a point you'll see when we get to the miscellaneous section. I've gotten way ahead of myself here in this bonus. Make sure you remember this all when you get to 1983. In what was an otherwise uneventful and easy defense of the undisputed title, George Foreman knocked out Jose Roman in the first round of their bout at the Nippon Budokan in Tokyo, Japan on September 1st. Roman, however, made history, becoming the first Puerto Rican to challenge for the heavyweight championship. The fight is also notable for how vicious Foreman's shots were. He was taking very large windmill style haymakers at the otherwise helpless and outmatched Jose Roman, like I'm talking Deontay Wilder style here. Foreman knocked him down three times, each knocked down more ruthless than the last. In the aftermath of the fight, Foreman was compared to the great Joe Lewis and gladly accepted such honors. Nine days later, in an immediate rematch of their march bout, Ken Norton welcomed Muhammad Ali with the challenge of avenging his loss earlier that year. Ali stated that he made a monster out of a nobody. The critics pounced on the chance to trash Ali after the loss to Norton, and it was evident in Ali's camp that if he lost the rematch, it was all over for the Louisville Lip. This time, Ali trained properly and took Norton seriously. He killed himself to get in the best shape for this matchup coming in at 212 pounds with a body almost identical to that of his form in the 1960s. The fight, again, was as evenly matched as the first, proving that Norton was no fluke and that his style was the answer to Ali's. Muhammad Ali was dancing and stinging almost as well as he had in the 60s. In fact, this may be Ali's best performance in his second career, showcasing his tremendous skill in the face of his kryptonite. However, every time Ali showed his skill, Norton came right back with his own magic. As the fight went on, naturally, Ali slowed down, but not enough to strip him of his ability to dance. His stamina in this fight was the best it had been in years. Norton was pounding away at every chance he could get when the two men came in close and piling up his points. When the 12th and final round came this time, things were different yet the same as last time. The similarity? Whoever won this round would win the fight. The difference? This time, Ali took the initiative and won securing his victory by split decision over a foe who perfectly countered his style and regained the NABF title. He'd avenged one of his losses. Now it was time to avenge his only other one. Just one month after avenging the loss to Ken Norton, Muhammad Ali remained on track and stamped his legitimacy as top contender home with a unanimous decision win over Rudy Lubers of the Netherlands. His next fight would be just the opportunity he'd been fishing for, a long three-year wait. Battle of the Sluggers But before we get to that, the pre-fight had a hell of a showcase with the rock, paper, scissors all present and in entertaining form. Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, and George Foreman, three revered heavyweight champs even at the time, all introduced and welcomed into the ring with Ali taunting, of course. Ali targeted Frazier initially, hyping their impending rematch, but switched up to George Foreman, foreshadowing that they would have to meet soon enough. Floyd Patterson was also present with the three champs, 
and did commentary on the fight. It's a beautiful slice of the times with incredible stakes that really puts into perspective how golden of an era this was. Now let's get to the fight, which you probably believe won't even live up to the pre-fight show from the greats. Well, the bout was a firefight as Jerry Corey ignored his corner's instructions and slugged with Ernie Shavers. Fortunately for Quarry, he struck first as he pounded Shavers, scoring a knockdown. Ernie barely survived the count and was punished for answering as Quarry continued the pain and pressure. Referee Arthur Mercanti stopped the fight and everyone went home having gotten more than their money's worth. Foreman said after how Quarry was a tiger and impressed him. Was this a subtle jab? You know, because Foreman was the lion of the division and trumped Tigers? Or am I looking too deep for something here? It's worth noting that this bout was originally supposed to take place in July, but Shaver suffered a broken jaw in sparring and needed time to heal. Everything happens for a reason, I suppose. What a magical night to end 1973 and usher in the historical landmark that would be 1974. To conclude 1973, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Well, that was a whirlwind. George Foreman was now the center of gravity, having obliterated Joe Frazier. Ken Norton entered the title picture with the duology against Muhammad Ali. A slew of other good bouts took place as well. Ring Magazine awarded Upset of the Year to Ken Norton in his destiny-altering conquest of Muhammad Ali. Of course, Ali avenged it later in the year, but Norton secured not only his place in the title picture for the decade, but his place in heavyweight history as one of the greatest conquerors. I'd like to personally note that I would have awarded a tie here as George Foreman's destruction of Joe Frazier shook up the world. In fact, it's still shocking to look back on. The Ring's Round of the Year was the second round of Frazier Foreman. Foreman's domination over the best heavyweight in the world shook up the division and solidified him as the premium force of terror in boxing. The Ring's Fight of the Year was, of course, the Sunshine Showdown, in which George Foreman easily dispatched of Joe Frazier. The Ring's Fighter of the Year in a clean sweep of the awards was Big George Foreman. Foreman was the best heavyweight in the world and the baddest man on the planet, unopposed. After avenging the loss to Norton, Ali was back on track and rolling again, beginning a successful run that would ultimately solidify him as the greatest in the minds of many boxing fans. After the loss to Quarry, Ron Lau fought eight more times on the year and won them all. However, the wins were more decisions than they were knockouts now. Ron Lau retired journeyman Gregorio Peralta. The two fought twice on the year. The first was a unanimous decision win for Lau while the rematch was a draw. Peralta finished his career with a record of 98 wins, 9 losses, and 9 draws, having knocked out 60 of his opponents. Argentina was in good representative hands with Oscar Bonavina, who Gregorio had fought twice already, once to a loss and the other to a draw. Peralta retired to a quiet life until his death in 2001. A young man hailing from Easton, Pennsylvania would make his debut and win all seven of his fights on the year. This man would also join Ali's sparring entourage and develop into one of the finest champions boxing would ever see. His name, of course, was Larry Holmes. The fact that he wasn't broken by Ali's camp speaks volumes to his heart and will, of which would be on display in the years to come. It is said that Ernie Shavers was seeking a fight with Joe Frazier around this time, but Frazier rejected the fight because it made no sense to sacrifice his limited years for low reward. He was only interested in Ali and Foreman. The once young lion was now the king of the jungle, 
undisputed and undefeated, the most menacing man to step foot in the squared circle since Sonny Liston, which is compelling considering he was Liston's sparring partner. Big George Foreman was the baddest man on the planet, and it looked as if he would reign for a long time to come. Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali had finally come to terms for a rematch. The two had faced a harsh reality in 1973, as it seemed both were on the decline, but 1974 would prove to be an even bigger year for both men in the world of heavyweight boxing. On January 23rd, five days before their scheduled rematch, Ali and Frazier met to review their first match on ABC's Wide World of Sports. When the 11th round came up for review, Ali called Frazier ignorant for bringing up the hospital when he was the one who spent a month in the hospital after their bout. Frazier, enraged, squared up on Ali and was ready to throw down while questioning why Ali thought he was ignorant. Studio crew, his own entourage, and even Ali's brother Rockman stepped in to stop Frazier from advancing. But Muhammad himself would act as the escalator when he stood up, grabbed Joe by the neck, and brought him down to the ground. As a bit of a bonus on that, that's also when he said, Set down quick, Joe. A scuffle broke out and the two men had to be restrained. Both men were fined $5,000 for their actions. Both men also appeared with Michael Parkinson on the Dick Cavett show where there was obvious tension between the two. The stage was set for what may have been the biggest rematch of all time. Finally, the two men who put on the fight of the century were butting heads again. January 28th saw Ali and Frazier return to Madison Square Garden for a grudge match. This time around, Ali came in with a more aggressive strategy to tag Frazier from the outside with the use of his usual straights and the inclusion of a hybrid hook and uppercut. This punch made sure he'd catch Frazier more often than not, who was ever the elusive target. Ali also refused Frazier the opportunity to fight on the inside by tying him up and getting the action back to the center of the ring. In the second, Ali had Frazier hurt and Joe may have been saved from going down by the referee who thought the round was over before it actually was. Flurries tying the left hook up and staying on the move allowed Ali to dominate the pace of the fight. He continued this pattern for the entire 12 rounds and won a decisive unanimous decision to retain the NABF title. Muhammad Ali had reversed the narrative. Both conquerors had now fallen to him, the two men who could be considered his kryptonite. He'd now beaten, a true testament to his greatness. With all the momentum in the world, there was only one thing left to prove, one thing left to regain. The opportunity would come later in the year. On March 19th at the Denver Coliseum in Denver, Colorado, heavyweight contenders Oscar Bonavina and Ron Lyle clashed in a rough, competitive 12-rounder. Unfortunately, there's no readily available footage of the bout, but according to reports, the fight went something like this. Oscar took the early rounds, Lyle took the middle rounds, and Oscar came back strong in the final rounds. Reportedly, the judges' scorecards weren't indicative of how competitive the fight was. It said that, at one point, Lyle hit Bonavina with a low blow out of frustration that he couldn't drop him. Lyle had hometown advantage, and it said that this helped him secure the win in what was an otherwise well-balanced fight. Now, why am I covering this fight in this chronology? Simply put, this would be the last fight of prominence for Oscar Bonavina, despite his final seven fights to come being wins. Tragedy would strike two years later, ending the career of one of the best contenders 
of the 70s. On March 26 in Caracas, Venezuela, undisputed champion George Foreman defended his crown against rising contender and fellow young lion, Ken Norton. Ali was present and announced before the fight that he and Foreman had signed to fight in September in Zaire, Africa, if the champion could beat Norton. Ali played Norton up and had him pick to win the bout, saying how difficult an opponent Norton was for any fighter and that George was in for a hard works night. The fight saw Foreman at perhaps his scariest, blasting Norton out in the second round with three bulldozing knockdowns. Now to Norton's credit, he answered each fall, but the referee wisely stopped the fight, and thank goodness he did. Even after being inactive for six months, Foreman showed zero rust and dominated the other man who'd beaten Muhammad Ali. Foreman would later comment on how if Norton had boxed him, the fight would have been better, crediting Norton's jab as one of the best he faced. Years later in George's comeback, his style looked to mirror that of Norton's as he hosted a more awkward crab-like stance and rhythm. In the aftermath in which both fighters and their camps looked to head back home to America, the Venezuelan government reneged on its no-tax agreement and demanded 18% of both Foreman and Norton's individual earnings. The fighters and their camps were even prevented from leaving the country at the airport by authorities until they paid up on the sudden change of heart. Norton resolved his issue first, paying between forty and $60,000. Foreman's issues persisted as the goalpost was moved and he paid somewhere around $300,000 before being allowed to leave in early April. The grand extortion led to the event getting its retroactive billing as the Caracas caper. I'll cover this aftermath in detail down the line here on my channel. The world began to really worry for the safety of Muhammad Ali as the bout approached. Even Foreman believed his own hype and felt he'd dispatch Ali as easily as he had Frazier and Norton. Foreman may be the scariest force in boxing history, and he wasn't a nice guy either. His mere presence brought about fear that could be likened to that of Darth Vader. In a rematch of their Ring Magazine Fight of the Year from 1969, Joe Frazier and Jerry Quarry once again locked horns. The bout was refereed by the great Joe Lewis and would only last five rounds, but controversy arose over referee Joe Lewis's timing and stopping the bout when he did. We'll get to that. Joe Frazier was doing the better work, outworking Quarry with his usual weaving and crisp digs to the head and body. In the opening round, Frazier was caught by an accidental stiff low blow, but regained himself after getting some time to recoup in his corner. In the fourth, Frazier dropped Quarry at round's end, but Quarry answered at the count of five. In the fifth, Frazier was further pounding away at Quarry and motioned for referee Joe Lewis to stop the fight, especially considering the bad cut Frazier had opened over the left eye of Jerry. Lewis would let the bout go on for another 30 seconds before stopping it citing that the cut was worse when he stopped it as opposed to when Frazier had requested him to do so earlier. It was the second big time rematch for Frazier on the year, but this one he'd won convincingly over a man that gave him a war five years earlier. Another contender for the most important fight of the decade happened on October 30th in Kinshasa, Zaire. The fight was a mega event with one hell of a buildup. 
It was a three-night musical event called Zaire 74 that saw performances from James Brown, B.B. King, The Spinners, and many more artists. The undercard for the fight took place in Pittsburgh, Massachusetts, and was helmed by several Custy Amato fighters. This was all originally scheduled for September 22nd through 25th, but George Foreman suffered a cut in sparring and the fight had to be pushed back to October 30th. Zaire 74 took place as scheduled from September 22nd to 24th, but the undercard and main event was pushed back to the 29th and 30th respectively. Both men spent the middle of the year acclimating themselves to the climate through training. Ali won over the people of Zaire and had them firmly behind him, birthing the Ali Bumbaye chant, which means Ali kill him. Ali weaved the perfect narrative to ensure the people would back him. He claimed George was a Belgian, of which the people of Zaire had been controlled by historically, and when George arrived with his pet German Shepherd, the dog the Belgians used in their oppression of the Zaire people, it provided merit to Ali's claim. Foreman was vilified in the build-up to the fight, but what else was new for Big George? Ali said he had something new planned for this fight. He knew everyone had Foreman picked and assured everyone that he would leave the game the same way he came in. To clarify, 10 years earlier, the then Cassius Clay upset Sonny Liston, another big and bad monster that was supposed to be unbeatable. Ali talked of how Liston was a better all-around fighter than George and how he himself was better than he was when he'd beaten Liston a decade earlier. Before the fight, news reached Ali's dressing room that Foreman's camp smelled death in the air. And this was like a shot in the arm as the entire Ali team was more ready than ever to rumble. The stage was set and it was time to put up or shut up. Finally, it was time for the rumble in the jungle. The old lion and the young lion. Foreman was a heavy favorite to put Ali away for good. The fight took place at 4 a.m. local time in the blistering heat. The stare down was the stuff of legends. Ali psychologically tearing at Foreman's returning death gaze. The fight was explosive to start with Ali striking George with disorienting straights and sticking him from the outside. Foreman began to catch Ali and lash out with his own bombs to the body as he pent Ali to the ropes. This trend continued for the majority of the fight as Foreman was wailing away at Ali on the ropes. Or was he? Despite being hammered, Ali was still landing the cleaner counter blows and George was wearing down as the rounds passed. In fact, Ali was preserving energy as Foreman waste his away, showcasing his strategy, the rope-a-dope. As the fight dragged on, Ali taunted George and held his head down. At last, the moment came in round eight when an exhausted George Foreman was caught in the trap of the greatest. Leaning on Ali as he punched away at him, Foreman found himself slipping into the corner himself as Ali lashed out with a vicious combination to the face that sent Foreman dancing to the canvas. Bob Sheridan's call of the spectacle only made it better, and one can only imagine the look on the face of Joe Frazier, who was present on commentary with Bob, Jim Brown, and David Frost. Foreman attempted to answer the count, but couldn't make it in time, and it was all over. Muhammad Ali had done the impossible again. He was once again the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world after wrongfully having his title stripped of him in 1967, becoming just the second man after Floyd Patterson, who he'd also conquered twice, to be a two-time heavyweight champion of the world. In the post-fight interview, Ali rightfully got his verbal payback on all those who doubted him and preyed on his downfall while demanding everyone be quiet and listen to him. The I told you speech is one of the best you'll hear from a warrior. 
I told you, I'm the real champion. I told you, I'm the champion of the world. All of you bow. All of my critics crawl. All of you suckers who write the Rain magazine, Boxing Illustrated. All of you suckers bow. If you want to know any damn thing about boxing, come to Muhammad Ali. I am the man. He earned it. Muhammad Ali was back and had beaten some of the best the decade had to offer while being past his best himself. He conquered his conquerors and regained the title by repeating history. Truthfully, he could have, and probably should have, retired right then and there. But the greatest was far from done and was ready to defend the crown he'd worked so hard to regain. As for the beaten champion, George Foreman slipped out amid the celebrations for Ali and entered the darkest phase of his life. He was truly beaten. It would take George many years to come to terms with his defeat, all of which would culminate in the greatest face turn and comeback in boxing history some 20 years later. The event itself has been the subject of historical reflection. It has seen many documentaries and movies, the most imperative of which is the 2001 Ali movie starring Will Smith. The movie had the rumble in the jungle as its climax. The boxing world lost a Cinderella man himself on November 29th. James J. Braddock was known for his upset wins, the most notable of which was over Max Bear, in which he was a 10 to 1 underdog. He would be entered into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in 2001 and have a film made on his life in 2005, starring Russell Crowe. He finished his career with a record of 52 wins, 26 losses, and 7 draws. Rest in peace. Cinderella Man. To conclude 1974, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Another whirlwind. Now, Muhammad Ali was once again the center of gravity in the division. History may not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Ali over Foreman was reminiscent of Clay over Liston. While Foreman disappeared into the shadows for the time, Joe Frazier was about to emerge for one last big run. Of course, so was every other challenger in this new Ali era. Is it even a question that Ring Magazine recognized what was said to be impossible? Muhammad Ali out rumbling George Foreman in the jungle is the upset of the year. The Ring's round of the year was the eighth and final knockout round of Ali Foreman. The Ring's fight of the year was the rumble in the jungle. The Ring's fighter of the year, unsurprisingly, was Muhammad Ali. Joe Bugner had five wins on the year, including one over Jimmy Ellis at Wembley. His work earned him a title shot in the coming year. Norton ended the year with a win, but wouldn't get another shot at the title for another two years. After the Bonavina win, Ron Lau won his other three fights on the year, one of which was against former champion Jimmy Ellis. He was looking great heading into 1975. Jimmy Young fought to a draw with Ernie Shavers and would get his shot at the title two years later. Larry Holmes was Muhammad Ali's sparring partner for the Rumble in the Jungle, but returned home to Easton when the fight was delayed. Larry won all three of his bouts on the year. Chuck Webner had a foul-filled fight that would see him lose four points for butting, low blows, and biting. He ultimately won that circus show of a fight in the 11th round and would go on to be Ali's first challenger for the title in the new year. That bout is historical, not for what happened per se, but for what it inspired. Muhammad Ali was back and had proven he was the best of his generation already, perhaps. But the job wasn't done. In stark contrast to his reputation as an outsider, Ali was invited to the White House by President Gerald Ford. The rumble in the jungle forever changed how the world would view the man who was once the most hated man on the planet. Those who were originally thriving at the expense of Ali were now on the downward spiral themselves.
Unfortunately, footage of this fight isn't accessible, so I'll be using footage from their second bout to compensate. On February 11th at Honolulu International Center in Honolulu, Hawaii, Ron Lyle and Jimmy Young clashed as top contenders for the right to the fight. Notably, Jimmy was a former sparring partner of Joe Frazier's. Young tied Lyle up whenever he came in close and thrashed him immediately on the break. Lyle chose to focus on Young's body and would lose a point for low blows in the third round. Young used his speed, skill, and defense to keep Lyle at bay to secure the win in 10 rounds by unanimous decision. The winner of this fight would surely get a shot at the title, right? Well, strangely enough, it was the loser, Lyle, who was the one who got the shot before the winner, Young. On the subject of their second fight, which would take place in November of the next year at the Civic Auditorium in San Francisco, California, Jimmy Young once again outboxed Ron Lyle using clever defense and a quick offense. One of the judges even had Young winning 11 of the 12 rounds. In a rematch of the fight that jump-started the decade, Former undisputed champion Smokin' Joe Frazier once again squared off against former WBA champion Jimmy Ellis. This was Frazier's tune-up for the inevitable third fight with longtime rival Muhammad Ali, mirroring the pattern of 1971. Who better than one of Ali's hometown friends, who he'd already beaten, to unify the titles in his own right? Was history about to repeat itself? In the five years since they had last met, both men had degraded but Ellis more so than Frazier. Ellis was in the twilight of his boxing career while Frazier was on the comeback trail, having faced some harsh realities since dropping the crown to George Foreman back in 1973. He lost the title, his rivalry with Ali was even now, and he was losing his eyesight. Joe knew his career was winding down and wanted to swing for the fences. This was a 12-round title eliminator that saw much of the same from their unification about five years earlier. Ellis won the first three rounds, but we know Frazier as a fighter who fills his opponents out. From the fourth round on, it was all Joe Frazier. In the seventh, Frazier opened a cut over the right eye of Ellis, and the ninth would see Angelo Dundee call for the fight to end, as he felt his man had had enough. Referee Bob Foster obliged, and Joe Frazier found himself back in the thick of things. His next fight would be for the title he so badly sought to regain against the men he so badly sought to squash in their rivalry. Ellis fought only one more time after this before hanging up the gloves for good. The former WBA champ had a good enough career to be remembered, having lost to the best of the crop from the 60s and the 70s. Perhaps his friend, Muhammad Ali, should have followed him into retirement. But that just wasn't to be. Originally, Ken Norton was slated to fight Oscar Bonavina in this bout. But Ringo pulled out because he couldn't get the guarantee of a title bout with the champ, Muhammad Ali, if he'd beat Norton. Jimmy Young was then considered, but brushed aside by Madison Square Garden because he lacked drawing power. On March 6, Jerry Quarry got the nod. Muhammad Ali had vacated the NABF title to face George Foreman. Speaking of the champ, this bout was the prelim to Ali's title bout against Chuck Wepner later that same day. Norton and Quarry genuinely didn't like one another, with Norton referring to Quarry as a prejudiced man. Quarry claimed there was a black conspiracy to keep him away from the title citing that Ali, Norton, and Foreman were all refusing to fight him. On March 24th at Madison Square Garden in New York, contenders Ken Norton and Jerry Quarry clashed for the vacant NABF title. Norton opened fast and continued to assault the easily cut eyes of Quarry, but Quarry stormed back time and time again. The fight was back and forth up until the fourth round, where Norton turned slugger and began battering Quarry at will going forward. The referee stopped the fight in the fifth as Quarry was fighting blind. Both men were covered in Quarry's blood. With this win, Ken Norton all but secured a third bout with rival Muhammad Ali, a bout that would be for the undisputed championship. Quarry, meanwhile, briefly retired after this bout. 
No one knew it yet, but this fight would turn out to be of grand significance, being that it inspired one of the greatest underdog stories of all time, Rocky. In a bout that I personally address as Rocky Zero, world champ Muhammad Ali took on the Bayon bleeder Chuck Webner. Webner was obviously outclassed, yet still persevered to almost go the distance. This was the first world title bout on American soil in 34 months. The fight saw Webner pulling every trick he knew to push the envelope against the champ and to no avail other than pissing Ali off and pushing the fight to the 15th and final round. In said round, Webner was TKO'd by a fed up Ali, but the seeds had been planted. Sylvester Stallone, who was watching from home, would go on to write the best Thanksgiving movie of all time and have one of the greatest careers in entertainment we will ever witness. Muhammad Ali would continue what was his second dominant reign, being past his best and marching through the division. One last piece of trivia, Ali's training camp before this bout was the last time Larry Holmes acted as a sparring partner. From here, Larry left the nest looking to fulfill his dream of becoming heavyweight champion of the world. Of course, the greatest wished his student the best of luck in his journey. In his first appearance since the embarrassment in Zaire at the hands of Ali, Foreman was at the center of a circus show. The event was meant to bring legitimacy back to Foreman, but only served to further tarnish his image in the public eye. It was a basket case of a show with no order and can be considered the lowest point of George's career. Ali was ringside to witness Foreman's dominance ahead of a prospective rematch. George was unhinged from the get-go, biting the bait on Ali's trolling trash talk and ready to mock Ali at every turn in the ring. It's important to note that at this time, George was so mentally destroyed by Ali that he was having nightmares of the night he lost in Zaire. Muhammad Ali was living rent-free in George Foreman's head, and it would be years before he truly recovered. Foreman came into the event at 232 pounds, a good 10 pounds give or take out of his usual fighting shape. Foreman first took on Alonzo Johnson, a sparring partner of Ali's. He danced around the ring, toying with Johnson, and received boos from the crowd. Ali began coaching Johnson, leading Alonzo to lean on the ropes to try and tire Foreman out. Enraged, George yanked Johnson off of the ropes and dropped him with a series of lefts. Foreman went over to taunt Ali as Johnson rose to his feet. Foreman ended him shortly after, but grew further enraged as the crowd chanted Ali's name. His next opponent, Jerry Judge, was formidable enough to stun George, forcing him to revert to his normal style, the style that beat Joe Frazier and Ken Norton easily. Foreman dropped Judge with a series of rights and again went to taunt Ali. Judge made it to his feet and to the next round where he would be stopped by Big George. Foreman then went over, insulted Judge, and a fight broke out between the two that saw Judge tackle Foreman to the canvas as the two exchanged blows in the rollabout. The crowd assaulted Foreman with booze. Bottles were thrown into the ring, and they continued chanting Ali's name. The third opponent was Terry Daniels, a man who Joe Frazier had given a shot years earlier. You may remember that he was badly outmatched. Foreman easily dispatched of Daniels, but not without Ali taunting that George could beat these five men, but not just one, Muhammad Ali. Daniels felt the stoppage was premature and started a fight with George after the fact. This led to Foreman shoving Daniels' trainer Foreman's trainer coming over to fight the trainer, and then George shoving his own trainer out of the ring. What a circus show this already was, and there were still two opponents to go. 
The final two opponents, Charlie Polite and Boone Kirkman, took Foreman the distance. Foreman's cardio was proving a problem. Ali also continued coaching the fighters from ringside. Foreman managed to drop Polite with a wild right, but Polite rose to his feet immediately and taunted the former champ. Foreman grew desperate in frustration over the fact that he couldn't stop Polite and began bullying his own cornermen. Ali showed off how to properly cover up from ringside. The Kirkman bout saw Ali ship tones and start cheering for George, which, of course, only pushed Foreman further into madness. Boone weathered the storm against George on multiple occasions and landed some solid shots of his own. With the exhibition over, Foreman went over to talk to Ali, only to see that the champion was gone, having moved on to his other ventures. In the interview after the fight, George trashed Ali and promoted himself as the best in the world, citing the night as proof. He insisted that no true fighter would lie on the ropes and that he could never be truly beaten. He even said he was ready to knock out Joe Frazier, Ken Norton, and Muhammad Ali. He gave his plan of beating every heavyweight and then retiring. He stated that the fights were so easy that they appeared fake to onlookers. Perhaps most notably, he said that Ali's trolling didn't bother him and that the extra weight he had was a plus. He belittled other fighters like Ron Lyle and Jerry Quarry. Long story short, he wanted Ali desperately and even cited how he'd beaten Ali's opponents in a more impressive fashion. Foreman's attempt at reviving his career and confidence had failed badly. He turned the crowd against him by making the five opponents the underdog, the exact opposite of what he planned for the narrative. He failed to knock the five men out as he promised. Foreman's career and life descended further into the darkness as he once again disappeared from the public eye. On May 16th at the Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, undisputed champion Muhammad Ali welcomed the challenge of slugging counterpuncher Ron Lyle. This was a surprise considering Lyle lost the bout to Jimmy Young earlier in the year that would supposedly elevate the winner. This fight showed us every style of Ali, acting as a retrospective of sorts on his in-ring ability. Ali started off with the Robodope, but found out quickly that it wouldn't work on Ron Lyle, or anyone else for that matter. He then switched off to a more peekaboo style, reminiscent of old foe Floyd Patterson, but this too failed to wear a challenger Ron Lyle. He then switched to fighting flat-footed, reminiscent of his war with Joe Frazier in the fight of the century, while dodging most of Lyle's punches with sharp head movement, which was reminiscent of his superhuman days in the 60s. It's important to note that while Ali was going through a picture show of his career, Lyle was busy winning the fight on the scorecards. The champion would have to get it together soon if he wanted to retain the title. In the seventh round, Ali went back to what had brought him to fame, holding like a butterfly and stinging like a bee. This continued as Ali went vintage, making Lyle miss and sticking him from the outside with the jab that has gone down as one of the best in boxing history. Finally, in the 11th, Ali exploded and overwhelmed Lyle, leading to the referee stopping the fight after Ali had to wave him over twice to do so. It was an 11th round technical knockout for the champ, his second defense of the undisputed title. Back in 1973, a chilling commercial aired to raise ALS awareness. The commercial featured former world champ Ezra Charles, who contracted Lou Gehrig's disease in 1968. Charles was notable for beating multiple Hall of Fame fighters across three weight classes. He began fighting as a featherweight in the amateurs before moving up to middleweight for the pros. He fought in World War II, returned as a light heavyweight, and scored wins over the likes of Archie Moore. He even inadvertently killed a boxer as he died from his injuries after the match. This shook Charles to the core, and he considered giving up boxing. He beat both Jersey Joe Walcott and Joe Lewis to secure the heavyweight championship. He was the only man to go the distance with Rocky Marciano and almost became the first man to regain the heavyweight title in a controversial points loss to Jersey Joe. He finished his career with a record of 95 wins, 25 losses, 
and one draw. Charles was very close friends with Rocky Marciano and was also friends with Ali when they both lived on 85th Street in Chicago. On May 28, 1975, in Chicago, Illinois, Desert Charles succumbed to ALS at the age of 63. Rest in peace to a real champion. On June 30th at Merdeka Stadium in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, undisputed champion Muhammad Ali put the crown on the line against the man he predicted would rule the division, Joe Bugner, in what could be seen as a tune-up for the inevitable trilogy ceiling fight with longtime rival Joe Frazier. For the most part, Ali dominated the action over 15 rounds, with a few Bugner spurts far in between. Ali verbally and physically stung Bugner in impressive enough fashion to earn a unanimous decision. Speaking of said unanimous decision, Ali originally planned to retire after this fight, but the decision spurred him on to announce he'd be fighting Frazier in a rubber match for the title later that same year. Bugner stated Ali was in for a hell of a fight in what can only be called prophetic. Perhaps equally prophetic was Don King's claim that the fight to come in Manila would be the greatest fight of all time. The clock was ticking. On September 13th at Denver Coliseum in Denver, Colorado, hometown fighter Ron Lau welcomed the challenge of Alabama slugger Ernie Shavers. Lau had lost to Ali earlier in the year and was on the comeback trail, while Shavers was still on the hunt for his world title bout. Lau spent the fight focusing his attack on the body of Shavers. The Black Destroyer had Lau in trouble when he knocked him down and had him dazed in the second round, but Lau was saved by the bell before Shavers had the chance to pounce on him and finish the job. The third round saw Lau bluffing that he wasn't hurt as he relied on his resiliency and counterpunching to keep Shavers at bay. He took some hard shots still, but made it to the decisive fifth round. In the fifth, the deadly combination of Lau's bodywork with Shavers gassing himself out led to Lau viciously dropping Shavers with a series of battering ram hooks. It's a miracle that Shavers wasn't seriously hurt from the shots he was taking and the bump he took as he collapsed to the canvas. Shavers was counted out, and this slugfest between two of the hardest hitters in the division's history would bridge into the greatest slugfest the division has ever seen. Ron Lyle had earned a shot at the NABF title and would have to get through Big George Foreman. That fight would kick off the next year. The undercard of the Thrilla in Manila saw the revenge of Larry Holmes. Well, kinda. Remember that big brother Dwayne had beaten Holmes back in the amateurs. Now, Larry was up against little brother Rodney in the pros. The big black cloud would become the only man to ever stop the ballless bear and continued his rise in the ranks on track to his dream of becoming heavyweight champion of the world. On the subject of Rodney Bobbick, he would fight until 1977, his last fight against Walter White. Any Breaking Bad fans here? Why such a premature ending to his career? Well, he tragically died in a car crash. Rest in peace, sir. The rubber match of all rubber matches. The trilogy. The Thrilla in Manila. This fight is as important to boxing as the fight of the century is. Barangay Kubao Quezon City would play host to arguably the most important and essential boxing match in history on October 1st, when reigning undisputed champion, the greatest, the Louisville Lip, Muhammad Ali, took on his arch enemy and chief rival, smoking Joe Frazier. The venue was the Araneta Coliseum. This fight 
was also historical for the fact that HBO made broadcast history, for it was the first ever continuous signal ever delivered via satellite. The build-up to the fight saw both camps looking to take a pre-fight advantage. Frazier's camp wanted a referee that wouldn't allow Ali to illegally hold Joe's head down to prolong clinches, and Ali's camp wanted a referee that wouldn't allow Frazier to illegally hit Ali low to wear him down without having to strike his body. Ultimately, Ali was able to secure a bigger ring to better suit his boxing ability, and Frazier got the referee his camp sought out. Ali's camp used the championship as leverage in securing their desires for the fight. The pre-fight buildup is the stuff of legends. Seeing Ali verbally tear away at Frazier with the famous line, As he broke Frazier down with the trolling, he had a gorilla action figure with him that he would beat as if it were a speed bag. The usual mind games from Ali only served to pile onto the inner rage that Frazier harbored, the dark hatred for his rival. Remember all that you've heard regarding Joe Frazier's career path up to now. The blinding eyesight, the loss of his crown by domination, the embarrassing loss in the rematch to the man who was his foil, his conqueror being dethroned by said foil he thought he'd originally squared away, the verbal assaults dating back to the late 60s, everything was coming to a boil for the great Joe Frazier, and he was ready to put his life on the line to beat the man he still referred to in spite as Cassius Clay. Ali, meanwhile, had to deal with the backlash of his infidelity as he introduced his mistress, Veronica Porsche, as his wife on a televised event. His actual wife, Khalila Ali, saw this and went to the Philippines to raise hell. Ali and his wife engaged in a verbal war in his hotel suite. On the other end, Frazier was preparing for this war in true Spartan fashion, even meditating hours at a time. The fight took place at 10 a.m. to accommodate the national viewing audience, pitting the two warriors against one another at the worst possible time for their health, as the stickiness of the night lingered into the baking sun of the morning. Frazier estimated that it had to be around 120 degrees Fahrenheit, taking into account the lights used to aid in the televising of the event. When the two rivals met at the center of the ring, Ali tried to mentally square Frazier away before the fight, but to no avail as Frazier simply replied, we'll see, with a smile. It was time to show who the greatest truly was. It was time for one man to etch himself into boxing history as the winner of winners. Ali started strong, knowing how slow of a starter Joe was, by coming out and going for the knockout. He also continued the verbal assault. Come the third round, he began using the Robodope. But this only served to benefit Frazier by allowing him the opening to batter Ali's body and hinder his movement in the long run. Ali continued on more aggressive than he'd ever been as Frazier continued to up the pressure as well. The race was on to see whose will would give. As Ali's work to the head was paying off with an increasingly blinded Frazier, Frazier's body work was paying dividends for him as Ali was growing slow and stiff. The sixth round saw Ali hit with shots that would have finished any other man and led to him questioning the narrative that Frazier was washed up, to which Frazier replied, they lied. The next two rounds saw Ali turn the tables and best Frazier in toe-to-toe -to -toe action before Frazier took back the momentum at the end of the eighth. The end of the ninth had Ali saying he'd never felt that close to death. Frazier's face was swelling to a dangerous point, and the heat in the venue wouldn't allow the corner to maintain an ice pack for stopping the swelling. He'd been pelted by hundreds of headshots, and by the 11th, was essentially fighting blind, as his trainer Eddie Futch questioned his use of his right hand over his left. Futch recommended Frazier take a more upright posture, and this proved detrimental for the challenger as Ali pounced on the opportunity and beat away at Frazier. In the 13th, 
Ali staggered Joe, as he had done in the second fight, and was rallied by seeing Joe step back. In the 14th, Ali continued to batter the blind Joe Frazier, but Frazier just wouldn't fall, and it seemed Ali had used up everything he had. The bell would not ring for the 15th, as Eddie Futch stopped the fight against Joe's pleas to continue. He assured Frazier that no one would forget what he'd done that day. Ali asked Angelo Dundee to cut his gloves off, but was ignored. He stated later that he was close to quitting himself, but Frazier simply beat him to the punch. Muhammad Ali, in what could be argued as his signature performance, had just retained his undisputed title for a fourth time. The judges also had Ali up by a comfortable margin. Ali said he lost five pounds by the end of the fight, something I can only compare to the intensity that Michael Jackson showed in his live performances in which he'd lose 10 pounds. Neither of these two gladiators, these two warriors, these two great men would ever be the same, even in their civilian life. Surely, Muhammad Ali could have and should have retired after this bout. There was nothing left to prove, right? Well, as Lennox Lewis once said, and I'm paraphrasing, fighting is like a drug that keeps you coming back. The rivalry was over, and Ali proved himself superior. But Joe Frazier, too, would be forever ingrained into boxing history as one of the greatest of all time. Still. Frazier never seemed to truly live down losing the rivalry to the man he detested. Years later, Ali said that if God ever called him to a holy war, he wanted Joe Frazier by his side. At the conclusion of 1975, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. And still, Muhammad Ali remained the top heavyweight, winning the trilogy against Joe Frazier. Contenders were rapidly rising, Ken Norton most notably, in his return to the title picture. He and some others would get their big chances soon in the age of Ali. The monstrous affair between Ron Lau and Ernie Shavers yielded our upset of the year. The reason being that hometown hero Lyle overcame adversity in the form of being floored by the hardest hitter in the history of the division, storming back to pave shavers into the canvas for the win. The ring's round of the year was the 12th round in Ali Frazier. The ring's fight of the year, as if there could be any other, was the thriller in Manila. The ring spider of the year, undoubtedly, was Muhammad Ali. Bernardo Mercado made his debut on November 15th with a first round knockout win. On August 14th, Scott Liddell fought George Johnson. Okay, so, well, this is where the fun begins. Initially, Ladu was awarded a split decision, but the enraged crowd reaction led to a retroactive change of the verdict to a draw. The crowd felt Johnson had won. Jimmy Young awaited his shot at the title, having watched the man he beat, Ron Lau, get the shot that probably should have been his. His time was coming in the new year. Joe Bugner was slowing down as the fight against Ali in the extreme heat took a severe toll on his body. He would only fight once in the coming year. Larry Holmes continued to act as a sparring partner to the great Ali and continued his undefeated streak while fighting on Ali undercards. Holmes won all nine of his fights on the year, eight of which were knockouts. His time in the limelight was also coming. An ex-Marine had won a national amateur title with light heavyweight and was looking to fight in the Olympics. This young buck would come to be known as Leon Neon Spinks. Whether anyone was ready to admit it or not, Muhammad Ali was coming to the end of his boxing days. The signs of wear and tear were to begin showing in the coming 1976, 
as it was evident that the punishment Ali was taking was catching up to him. Manila had effectively started the countdown for both Ali and Frazier. Ali's domination was noticeably winding down. To open 1976, former undisputed champion George Foreman took on Ron Lyle at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada. The venue would come to be known as the home of champions. Boxing fans have long wondered what could have come of a slugfest between killers George Foreman and Ernie Shavers. This bout, which can only be referred to as a home run derby, serves as a mirror of sorts for the what if battle. On January 24th, in a fight that I personally bill as Godzilla vs. King Kong, arguably the most entertaining, action-packed fight of all time took place. Lau made it very clear that he didn't fear Foreman, though Big George didn't budge in his intimidation tactics. The stare-down was so tense that it still radiates through the screen to this day. The fight began with the oh, wow. wildest right Almost hand you'll see right in a professional Lyle boxing match as Lyle threw himself at Foreman, amateur style. The fight saw the two trading power punches the entire way, with both men crashing to the canvas on multiple occasions. However, it would be the will of George Foreman that would prevail in the fifth round when he viciously finished a gas Lyle. Howard Cosell managed to make this event even better with his colorful commentary that told the story like no other. The fourth round saw Lyle drop Foreman. Foreman stormed back to drop Lyle, and then Lyle dropped Foreman again in the closing 10 seconds of the round. Foreman showed he had maybe the greatest heart in a division when he answered the knockdown at the end of that round. Foreman came into the fifth and ended matters with 20-something unanswered punches that sent Lyle crashing to the canvas in the same manner that Lyle had sent Shavers crashing down the previous year. It was a fifth-round knockout for Big George Foreman in a battle of blood, guts, and will. Foreman, even in his heel persona of the time, gave Ron Lyle credit. And all of this after he'd verbally brushed Lyle aside the previous year during his five-man match in Toronto. This fight is the heavyweight version of Hagler vs. Hearns, or rather the inverse is true, as this fight happened first. It's a real-life Rocky fight that set the bar way too high for expected action in a bout. It will almost certainly never be topped. The foreman stated years later that Ron Lyle was one of the three men who hit him the hardest, along with Jerry Cooney and Cleveland Williams. Foreman's image certainly took a positive turn here as he continued his trek back to the heavyweight championship, his trek back to Muhammad Ali. In his return to the ring for the first time since the Thrilla in Manila, world champion Muhammad Ali made five rounds work of Jean-Pierre Michael Koopman, knocking him out in the fifth. It was Ali's fifth title defense and his 50th win as a professional. Quite the milestone. This remains the first and only heavyweight title bout ever held in Puerto Rico. Does Ali look any different to you in this one? Like the thrill in Manila definitely took a lot out of him? You tell me. The champ would return to the ring in two short months. On April 30th at the Capitol Center in Landover, Maryland, undisputed world champion Muhammad Ali faced off against top-ranked contender Jimmy Young in a battle of similar styles. Like Ali, Young was a defensive counterpuncher who liked to stick and sting from range. It was the old master up against the new student. 
According to CompuBox, Young outlanded Ali on higher volume and percentage across 15 rounds, including jabs and power punches. However, whenever Ali would apply the pressure to Young and get serious, Young ducked outside of the ropes. The referee counted the 12th round duck as a knockdown and began counting, to which Young returned to the ring at the count of two. Whenever Ali took the initiative as the dancing master, he was controlling the action. But when he stood flat-footed, Young was more so in the driver's seat. Ken Norton, who had scored a fifth round TKO earlier in the night against Ron Stander, was present and barking at Ali to get it together. Norton said that Ali looked pitiful on the night, but knew that his rival would be adequately prepared for their coming title bout later in the year. Despite this all, Muhammad Ali won by unanimous decision over Jimmy Young. It was his fifth title defense. On May 22nd, tragedy once again struck the boxing world with the death of longtime contender Oscar Bonavina. Since losing to Ron Lyle in 1974, Ringo was on an undefeated trail at Mustang Ranch near Reno, Nevada. Bonavina was shot dead by a security guard after Oscar had come into conflict with the owner. He was only 33 years old. His body was returned to his home country of Argentina where he was buried at La Chacarita Cemetery in Buenos Aires. He finished his career with a record of 58 wins, 9 losses, and 1 draw. Rest in peace to one of the best fighters who never won the big one. In what would be his final knockout victory, Muhammad Ali bounced the courageous Richard Dunn off the canvas five times, thrice in the fourth and another two times in the fifth where the fight was stopped. Despite Dunn's continuing to advance forward, through the referee's grasp. Ali was winding up his right for the kill in true character and form. Perhaps the last time Ali looked like Superman. It had been three years since the Sunshine Showdown, and much had changed for former champions Big George Foreman and Smokin' Joe Frazier. The Invincible Foreman had been nerfed to size, and Frazier was the victim of a bitter comeback. The common denominator, of course, was the great Muhammad Ali. Foreman and Frazier agreed to fight for the NABF title that Foreman had just won against Ron Lyle earlier in the year. Now on the surface, you'd think both men were gunning for a shot at the champ Ali, but it was deeper than that. While Foreman was indeed borderline lusting for a rematch with Ali, Frazier had just come off of the thrill in Manila and was more so focused on avenging his embarrassing loss to George Foreman. On June 15th at Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum in Uniondale, New York, the Day of Destiny was on. Frazier shocked everyone when he revealed he'd shaved his head in his dressing room just before the fight. The stare down was scary, just as the last one was, and the action would prove different this time. Whereas Joe was known for his smothering aggressive pressure, this time he came out with a more cautious and defensive style. Frazier looked to peck away at George from the outside while using a random rhythm of head movement. Frazier was also taunting Foreman to land a punch and frustrating him perhaps utilizing the tactic Ali did in Zaire. It all worked initially, but the aging ex-champion couldn't keep the pace up forever. Foreman was also beginning to better time Frazier, and the fight devolved into a mirror of what had happened three years earlier. Remember, too, that Foreman said he'd knock Frazier out again back in 1975. Foreman took control of the fight by focusing on Frazier's body and managed to deck Smokin' Joe in the fifth, sending him to the canvas. Frazier answered the count and was sent back to the canvas almost immediately. Eddie Futch stepped in and stopped the fight on his fighter's behalf, and George Foreman had secured a fifth-round technical knockout over Joe Frazier. Further cementing 
that what had happened in Jamaica was no fluke. Foreman was looking deadly good on his comeback trail now and appeared to be etching ever closer to a rematch with the aging undisputed champion. But there was still a ways to go down the road for the former champion. This would be the last fight for Smokin' Joe Frazier in the 70s as he would take a five-year layoff from the sport. The illustrious career of Joe Frazier had wound down, as was expected for a fighter who utilized his style. He may not have avenged his losses to rivals Ali and Foreman, but he never went out without a fight and proved himself to be perhaps the gutsiest fighter to ever lace up the gloves. In a truly bizarre event that saw boxing and professional wrestling crossover, two boxer versus wrestler matches took place. The first was Andre the Giant versus Chuck Wepner, and the latter was Muhammad Ali versus Antonio Inoki. The latter match took place in Japan at the Nippon Budokan Arena in Tokyo, while the rest of the event took place at Shea Stadium in Flushing, New York. Chuck Webner lost his match to Andre the Giant when he failed to answer the count after being thrown out of the ring. Webner's match against Andre may have inspired a portion of Rocky III, where Rocky fights the wrestler Thunderlips and is similarly thrown out of the ring. Ali and Inoki's match was specifically billed as the war between the worlds. The bout saw Ali land only two jabs as Inoki lie flat on his back and kick Ali in the legs. The kicks caused two blood clots and an infection that almost led to Ali's leg being amputated. The fight was called a draw. Ali and Inoki became good friends after the event, with Ali flying out in 1998 to see Inoki's last match before his retirement. Strangely enough, the event is seen today as a precursor to the growing popularity of mixed martial arts. Inoki's student went on to found Pancreas, which inspired the founding of Pride Fighting Championships, who were acquired by the UFC in 2007. This event wouldn't be the last time that Ali collaborated with the world of professional wrestling. At the 1976 Olympic Boxing Heavyweight Program, gold medalist Teofilo Stevenson repeated when he once again brought the gold home for Cuba and a win over Romania's Mircha Simon. Stevenson was offered $5 million to come straight out of the Olympics into a championship match against Muhammad Ali, but declined, stating that the love of his people was worth more than the money. Stevenson would go on to win a third gold medal at the 1980 Olympics and may have won an unprecedented fourth and fifth in 84 and 88 if the Soviet Union hadn't boycotted the games which Cuba followed suit as they were allies. As consolation, Stevenson did score a win over eventual gold medalist Tyrell Biggs. The Cuban legend passed away on June 11, 2012. We can only wonder how a professional birth would have turned out for the Olympic 3 peat champion. Rest in peace, champ. On the subject of the Olympics, Leon Spinks won gold at light heavyweight and his brother Michael Spinks won gold at middleweight. The Sphinx brothers were on course to make waves in the heavyweight division in the coming years. Continuing his demolition derby under the cloud of the rumble in the jungle, George Foreman stopped Scott Little in three rounds, becoming the first man to drop Little. As was usual with Foreman in the golden age, it was brutal and vicious, as Foreman showed no restraint. On September 28th at Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, New York, reigning and defending undisputed heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali put his crown on the line against rival Ken Norton in the finale of their heavyweight trilogy. The fight saw Norton ultimately outland Ali, according to CompuBox, but observing the fight showed it to be as even as the first two, once again coming down to the final round. Norton's corner, who felt he was well enough ahead, suggested he fight cautiously in the final round, despite Norton never having been in any trouble at the hands of Ali's power. Ali took the initiative in the final round and ultimately won the war against Norton in his sixth title defense. But the manner by which he won the fight is disputed to this day. 
There are fight fans who argue for the fight to have gone out of the way, but what can't be argued is that the fight was a unanimous decision win for Ali. Ali would later say that even he felt Norton edged it out that night. The Ali-Norton rivalry had ended the same way it started, an even fight had ended in an upset as the fans booed the decision for Ali and Norton broke down crying. Ken considered retiring after the bout and maintained that he had won that fight. He would never again trust boxing judges. This bout would end up as the last boxing match to take place in the famous Yankee Stadium before its demolition 34 years later. With this win, Muhammad Ali had won the rivalries against the two men who'd beaten him and that could be considered his kryptonite style-wise. The legend of Muhammad Ali had become self-sustaining. Returning to the ring for the first time since challenging Muhammad Ali for the crown in their rematch, Joe Bugner finally came to fight and dwarfed Richard Dunn in the first round. Bugner grounded Dunn thrice, scoring the knockout victory. This is the version of Bugner that many wanted to see more of, but never seemed to show up. If he showed up in this form for his next fight five months later, we should be in store for another legendary slugfest. See you there for Joe Bugner versus Ron Lyle. Big Mean George was back and this time with an easy mode TKO over John Dino Dennis. Foreman battered Dennis bloody. What'd you expect, an upset? However, Foreman did credit Dennis for daring to trade with him and was humble when asked if he rated himself as the top heavyweight. Foreman also credited God for making everything possible for him. His personality change was noted and foretelling of the man he would become. Foreman also made it clear that this was his comeback trail and he had only one goal that mattered, avenging his loss to you know who and regaining the heavyweight title. A battle more so significant in hindsight given the future would hold much opportunity for both of these South African fighters. Harry Kutsia took Kali Kanutsa's O with a 10 round decision, establishing he was superior for the time being. But would the aforementioned future maintain said standing? You'll have to wait till things heat up big time in 1979 when we check back in with both sluggers. On November 21st, one of the most important movies in modern history was released, A True Cinderella Story, with an equally compelling backstory from writer and creator Sylvester Stallone. As was mentioned earlier, the Ali Wepner fight was the inspiration for Sly Stallone to write a story about the human will and going the distance in life. It went on to win Best Picture, two other Academy Awards, and was nominated for 10 it is considered to be one of, if not the greatest sports movies of all time. As for the best boxing film, it's between this and Raging Bull, which will be released in 1980. Rocky may also be the best Thanksgiving film ever made. Rocky tells the story of a 30-year-old nobody, Rocky Balboa from Philly. He works as a debt collector for a loan shark and also boxes. The opportunity of a lifetime comes for Rocky when champion Apollo Creed selects him as the replacement for his injured opponent. As great as the fight is, the film is made by the varying characters and how they interact with one another. It's warm, genuine, and humble. You know Rocky doesn't really have a chance against Creed, or does he? In the end, 
it was never about winning. It was about going the distance and proving yourself. A message that has resonated with viewers over 40 years later. The unlikely success of this rags to riches story would propel the career of Sylvester Stallone and birth a legendary franchise. Even more impressive is that the movies continue to be well made and executed with the exception of the fifth film, and even that's debatable considering the work print of Rocky V. Rocky was made on a budget of $1.1 million and grossed $225 million. That would be akin to a latter-day $4 million movie making $1 billion in returns. Stallone insisted that he star in the film and was paid a total of $1 because the producers didn't trust him with the role. He bet on himself and it more than paid off. To conclude 1976, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. That's three straight now with the greatest exits of year rating supreme. It was a rough one with some questionable calls, but Ali remains atop the mountain. Still, contenders were not just going to lie down and would continue coming on hard against the fading center of gravity, Muhammad Ali. Some near misses on the year with both Jimmy Young and Ken Norton coming close to dethroning Muhammad Ali. I'm going to give the award to George Foreman for scraping himself off the canvas twice to battle back and brutalize Ron Lyle to oblivion. That fight will never be topped. Though Fury Wilder 3 was a nice effort. The ring's round of the year was a tie between the fourth and fifth rounds of Foreman and Lyle. The ring's fight of the year was the Foreman Lao barroom brawl. The ring's fighter of the year was the beast on the comeback trail, Big George Foreman. On September 27th, Trevor Burbick debuted with a fifth round tactical knockout win. On October 2nd, Dwayne Bobbick stopped Chuck Wetner on cuts, moving to 37-0. Along the way, Bobbick beat Scott Ledoux and future champion Mike Weaver with most of his wins coming by stoppage. He would ascend to one more victory before taking his first real leap in opponent quality in the coming 1977. On October 15th, Michael Dokes debuted with a two-round rep stoppage win. He dropped his opponent, Al Bird, twice before the stoppage on cuts. Ernie Shavers won all three of his bouts on the year and had also won the rebound fight after the Lyle loss just two months after. He was heading into 1977 with strong momentum en route to his big break. Finally returning from his exile, George Foreman badly wanted the Muhammad Ali rematch, but it would never come to be. Foreman would only fight four more times in the 1970s. Joe Frazier's five-year layoff concluded with his return in 1981, in which he fought to a draw. That was his last match, and Smoke and Joe retired to his Philadelphia gym, where he would focus on overseeing the career of his son, Marvis. Larry Holmes won all four of his bouts on the year, the hardest of which was against Roy Williams. Williams had settled a dispute over money with Ali in a 10-round gym war, which was allegedly one of Ali's toughest fights. Holmes was more than ready for the bout against Williams. Muhammad Ali was still on top of the division, but the signs of his deteriorating health were becoming ever more evident. Frazier was gone, and Foreman was on his way out, despite the hunt for a rematch. Who would be brave enough to tell the champ it was time to hang it all up. On January 16th aboard the USS Lexington in Pensacola, Florida, sorry, I had to because of Roy Jones Jr., 
The big black cloud Larry Holmes took on Tom Prater. George Foreman was on commentary for the bout and praised Holmes, citing how his training was paying off. When Howard Cosell brought up Foreman's upcoming bout with Jimmy Young, Foreman didn't sound too worried or concerned. Holmes dominated the action, with the exception of a few spurts of Prater giving Holmes some trouble. He won a lopsided unanimous decision and advanced further toward the heavyweight title. This fight was the first in a championship series of bouts. Back again on the path of revenge was big, mean George Foreman. His victim this time was Pedro Agosto. Foreman dropped his prey twice in the third and three times in the fourth, which forced a stoppage. His next bout would be arguably the most important fight of his career and life, molding the very being of George Foreman. See you there in two short months in Puerto Rico. George Foreman was building momentum well en route to a highly anticipated rematch with conqueror Muhammad Ali and wore his bitterness on his sleeves. Foreman made it a point to address Ali as Clay, a tactic that always got Ali riled up. In an interview in which he trashed Ali as a phony who didn't even draw in the sport, Foreman saw his bout with Jimmy Young as a mere formality on the road to getting his revenge against Ali, even arriving late to San Juan and not adjusting to the climate in preparation for the fight. On March 17th in San Juan, Puerto Rico at Roberto Clemente Coliseum and what would go down as the 1977 Fight of the Year. Former undisputed champion George Foreman took on highly regarded contender Jimmy Young. Young fought a brilliant tactical affair, as he always did, against Big George, who was hitting on the break and bullying Young with pushes. Jimmy was on the move and hitting George with successive combos on the inside and the outside. The seventh round was a great round for Foreman, but not great enough. George hurt Jimmy bad and had him stumbling around the ring, but Foreman couldn't finish the resilient Young off. In fact, Jimmy himself admits even he doesn't know how he survived Foreman's onslaught. Foreman's frustration led him to show he can unleash his power in a later round. Young resembled Ali more than ever on this night and had the crowd firmly behind him. From the seventh on, it was Jimmy Young who was the aggressor, peppering Foreman with impressive combinations to the head and body. Foreman showed great resilience and continued stalking Young around the ring. In the 12th, Young's work paid incredible dividends when he dropped Foreman and sealed the deal on a unanimous decision win that sent Foreman's hopes at an Ali rematch to the Shadow Realm. Foreman was very bitter in the post-fight interview and retreated to his dressing room. What happened in Foreman's dressing room depends on who you ask. It is said that Foreman had a religious experience in which he gave his life to God and overcame the darkness he'd been in since 1974. It is also said that Foreman hallucinated due to exhaustion. Whatever you choose to believe, Foreman was born again that day and began his journey back to the heavyweight championship of the world a good 17 years before it was to be. At the age of 28, Big George Foreman walked away from everything and went home to become a preacher and live his life for the Lord Jesus Christ. He would not return to boxing until March 9th of 1987, announcing that he was coming back for the title that he never managed to regain. Foreman's image as the big bad would fade away as he embraced being the jolly old man of the division. What George Foreman accomplished on November 5th, 1994 is a subject for another retrospective to come down the line on this channel.
In a bout that had been rendered unnecessary by the events that transpired three days earlier, Ron Lau and Joe Bugner squared off at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada. Originally, the winner of this bout would get Foreman in a shot at usurping him in the rankings toward a bout with Ali. Lyle would get a chance at revenge against Big George, and Bugner would get the win he needed to be one step closer to another title shot and the fuel he needed to alleviate the pressure Europe was putting on him as their disappointing champion. The fight was a grueling 12-rounder that saw Lyle win by split decision. The fight was a defensive, cautious affair that saw Lau be the more aggressive of the two. Honestly, it could have gone either way. Bugner took six months to recover from the bout, having to spend time in an ice tank in the hospital. The press he got from the British, in particular Henry Cooper, was too much for Ozzy Joe, and he retreated to drinking and partying in hotels. He would not fight again until 1980, and would miss out on the championship sweepstakes of the late 70s. As I mentioned earlier, Bugner had better days ahead. Though he fizzled out from this point on, he was inspired by the comeback of George Foreman in the 90s, made his own comeback, and won the WBF heavyweight title at the age of 48, making him, at the time, the oldest champion in boxing history. This is the last notable fight of Bugner's in this retrospective, hence why I'm bringing his great feet up again. Muhammad Ali held a public exhibition, the one of note coming against 19-year-old youngster Michael Dynamite Dokes. Ali was training on the road to his title bout against Alfredo Evangelista. He taunted and toyed with the inexperienced Dokes. During the exhibition, Ali put on what may be the greatest can't-touch-this display ever when he pinned himself to the corner and dodged Dokes' blows as if he had ultra instinct. Notable if you consider this was a nerfed Ali with deteriorating skill against the man who may have the fastest hands in heavyweight history. Evander Holyfield said years later that Dokes had the fastest hands of anyone he faced. After the fun, Ali remarked that Evangelista couldn't hope to be better than the sparring show of the night. On May 11th at Madison Square Garden in New York, Ken Norton squared off against Dwayne Bobbick, who was unbeaten in 38 bouts. The winner was expected to get Ali in a title bout. Bobbick was expected to win the fight. He had Eddie Futch, Norton's former trainer, in his corner, and all the momentum coming into the bout with the veteran Norton. In just 58 seconds, Ken Norton derailed the plans of the boxing world and knocked Bobbick out. A fourth fight with Ali seemed to be in the cards for Norton, a chance to avenge the robbery at Yankee Stadium. Considering that George Foreman was out of the Ali sweepstakes after the disaster two months earlier, it seemed destined that the boxing world would get a fourth entry into the Ali-Norton saga. One month later, Muhammad Ali's claims were up to the test against challenger Alfredo Evangelista. Everyone knows better by now than to doubt Ali, though. It was a display that showed how faded Ali already was by this time, as he scraped by with the 15-round decision win over an opponent he would have made child's play of in earlier years, never mind at his very best. Ali was impressed he danced for 15 rounds at 35 years old, or at least wanted the public to think and feel as such. The champ would return in four short months to hopefully look better than he had in a while against the man on the harshest of hunts for the world title. Four months after destroying Dwayne Bobbick, Ken Norton returned to the ring and knocked out Lorenzo Zanon in five rounds after two knockdowns in said final round. That's two great wins in the aftermath of the robbery against Muhammad Ali, and his next fight would be his chance to force his way into number one contendership against another contender familiar with robbery. The Greatest and the Acorn 
Muhammad Ali found himself against a man who many agree to be the hardest hitter in boxing history, the Black Destroyer, Ernie Shavers. It's worth noting that Ali entered the ring to the Star Wars theme. In the stare down before the bout, Ali made fun of Shaver's bald head, another reference to his deeming Shaver's the acorn. Shaver's had Ali hurt badly in the second and 15th rounds, but he whiffed and failed to finish the champ off. Or maybe it was the greatness of Ali that got him through the adversity. Ali managed to fool Shaver's by play acting that he was more hurt than he actually was, preventing Shaver's from going for the knockout. Ali finished each round strong to gain the favor of the judges. In the 15th, Ali retaliated to being hurt by hurting Shavers badly himself to close the fight, but he couldn't knock Ernie out. Ultimately, Ali won a unanimous decision and secured his 8th title defense. He said that Shavers hit him the hardest anyone ever did, claiming he hit him so hard it shook his kinfolk back in Africa. The Shavers fight, in particular round 15, is viewed by many as the true last hurrah of the greatest. The end of his second career's best days in spite of the miracle he was to pull off the next year. Ali's performance against Shavers may be one of the best of his career and acts as a true testament to his greatness. The man was far removed from his prime and still pulled off the win against the hardest hitter in heavyweight history. Now that's greatness. Shavers was very upset and made it clear that he felt he was robbed. MSG swore to never host another Ali match ever again, insisting that he retire. Ali's health was becoming more serious a point of contention to his competing, as his erosion was growing more obvious with each match. Everyone wanted Ali to hang up the gloves. Everyone but Ali himself and some others in his camp looking for money. On the undercard of Norton Young, Jerry Quarry had his last fight of the decade against Lorenzo Zanon. Zanon won every round on the cards until the 8th and was stopped in the 9th by the Bellflower Bomber. Close one, and here's why. Quarry's resume in the 70s saw him only lose to Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, and Ken Norton. Those are three of the top fighters of the decade and it puts into perspective how profound of a contender he'd remained since the 60s. No shame in only having lost to those three and beating the rest, a list which includes Ernie Shavers and Ron Lyle. Corey would return in 1983 for two fights before a final return in 1992 where he hung up the gloves for good. Boxing broke him physically and he would not live too much longer after his retirement. But you'll get that scoop in the 90s timeline. Also, before we move on, Lorenzo Zanon would fight six more times in the 70s, one of which saw him take Alfredo Evangelista's O before getting his big break in the 80s for the heavyweight title. He retired in 1981. One last thing. Also on this undercard, did Larry Holmes score a TKO win in the 10th and final round against Ibar the Sailor Man Oddington. The win earned Holmes a title eliminator bout against a former sparring partner of his, a bout that would be his first true test against a step up in competition. On November 5th at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada, the number one and two ranked contenders respectively, Ken Norton and Jimmy Young engaged in a WBC title eliminator. The winner was guaranteed a title bout against Muhammad Ali. The fight was even seeing Norton go to the body and Young attack the head. Ali was ringside and screamed into the ring near the end that he didn't want to fight Norton, showing his support for Jimmy Young. The fight ultimately came down to the final round, a round that saw the two men go back and forth for the full three minutes in desperation for the win. Norton won the round and the fight and Jimmy Young was now the victim of yet another potential robbery. It's worth noting that referee Carlos Padilla said he would have given the fight to Young. Norton's split decision win meant that Ali Norton 4 was on. This was a strong end to the year and assured the boxing world that 1978 was going to be a good one for the heavyweight division.
To conclude 1977, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Somehow, some way, Muhammad Ali was still the number one heavyweight. The division ran through him, and all that barking over the years about being the greatest was looking to be reality rather than mere promotion. Watch out for those rising contenders, champ. Jimmy Young banishing George Foreman to retirement, beginning the greatest comeback in boxing history unbeknownst to everyone, is taking home upset of the year. George Foreman's replenishing allure of invincibility had been snuffed out for good this time, it seemed. The ring's round of the year was the 12th round of Foreman and Young. The ring's fight of the year was the Foreman-Young match. And the ring did not select the heavyweight as fighter of the year, but if we had to give it out to someone, it's gotta go to Ken Norton, who'd been riding high as a fighter since his controversial loss to Muhammad Ali. Norton was on a mission to become champ and was closer than ever after defeating Jimmy Young, who I must admit himself had a brilliant year and would have won this honor if he'd beaten Norton. On January 21st, Randall X. Ah, made his debut with a first round TKO victory. On February 15th, Jerry Cooney made his professional debut with a first round knockout over Bill Jackson. Cooney would rise to prominence in the 80s when he began taking on the big names of the division. After the Bugner win, Ron Lyle fizzled out. Two years later, he scored a win over Scott LaRue despite going down in the third round. In the 80s, Lyle fought only thrice, one of which came against the next big thing, Jerry Cooney. He returned in 1995 and won all four of his bouts before retiring for good. There were talks of matching up Ali and Holmes for about in May, but it didn't materialize and Ali defended the title against Alfredo Evangelista in an unimpressive 15-round unanimous decision for his ninth title defense. The big black cloud wouldn't get a shot at the title until the next year, and a shot at Ali for another three years. It was obvious around the division that Muhammad Ali was more beatable than ever before as his career winded down and everyone was looking for their chance at an easy win. Ironically, it would be Ali who sought the easiest of wins going into the new year, a decision that would lead to the division not seeing unity again until the reign of the great Iron Mike Tyson. This was the year that boxing politics were being schemed into the sport. The higher-ups were plotting the multi-title future that was to forever dilute the titles. The plan was to prepare for the exit of Ali, but what a mischievous way to go about it. In the fall, Muhammad Ali appeared on Donahue and when asked who would take over the mantle when he retired, said he could see rookie Leon Spinks, who debuted and won all seven of his fights on the year, doing as much. Uh, well, <laughs> about that, champ. The champion was defying the odds all around. His age and health were crippling him daily, yet he still continued to reign over the division. Though these latter years showed the true greatness of Ali, it's evident that the danger he was putting himself in the line of may not have been worth it in the long run. If there was truly a point Ali should have exited the game, it should have been after the last hurrah against Shavers. Overall, 1977 was a year of missed and lost opportunities that saw the division lose one of its greatest warriors. Now with Frazier and Foreman out of the mix, the time was coming for Ali to hang up the gloves and the search was on for the man who would take his place. There was a good wealth of talent to choose from. In his eighth straight win since losing to Harry Kutsia in the showdown of the South African standouts, Kali Kanutsa knocked out Dwayne Bobbick in the third round. He would boost his streak to 11 victories 
before entering the long-awaited WBA tournament in the next year, but I'm getting well ahead of myself. In fact, so far that it borders on spoiler territory. We'll get to that. Yet another drop in Bobak stock. In 1977, there were efforts to bring the legend Floyd Patterson out of retirement for a third bout with Ali. These plans fell through, and the opportunity was instead given to little-known novice Neon Leon Spinks. The Olympic gold medalist had only seven bouts under his belt and was chosen by Ali as an easy fight. Spinks shocked the boxing world by upsetting Ali by split decision and becoming the new undisputed champion. In fact, Spinks dominated the action from start to finish against the ill-prepared Ali, landing 419 punches, more than any Ali opponent before or after. With this win, Leon became the first fighter since James J. Braddock to win the title by decision, a feat that dated back to June 13th of 1935 when Braddock defeated Max Baer. The fourth Ali Norton fight was thrown to oblivion just like that, and it would be Spinks that Norton was to challenge for the undisputed crown. Or so the boxing world thought. And side point, was it a conspiracy by Ali not to fight Norton again by dropping the title? Norton himself believes it was 100% true and not a conspiracy. Leon Spinks, and he lost that one on purpose. He lost it on purpose. There's no way in the world at that particular time of his life, even though he was slowing down, that a man who was just turning pro could beat him. About a month later, on March 18th, the WBC withdrew its recognition of Spinks as champion due to his refusal to face their mandatory number one contender, Ken Norton. Spinks instead chose to face Ali again later that year. The titles would not be unified again along with the new IBF title until 1987 when Iron Mike Tyson beat Tony Tucker to cap off his winning of the tournament. True unification would come in 1988 when Tyson blasted Michael Spinks to become the lineal and ring magazine champion. Almost a decade without an undisputed champ worked to truly cement the legacy of Iron Mike, being that he was the first undisputed champ since one of his idols, Muhammad Ali. On a quick side note, Larry Holmes had the opportunity to become undisputed champion after it had evaded him during his long reign, but failed to do so when he was knocked out by Mike Tyson in 1988, the only time Holmes was ever stopped. On March 25th at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada, Contenders Larry Holmes and Ernie Shavers would square off to decide the number one contender for Leon Spinks' unified title and a WBC title eliminator. Shavers was ranked third and Holmes fourth. Holmes' courage as a fighter, for whatever reason, was questioned coming into this bout, and he knew it. The bout with the legitimate Black Destroyer would certainly serve to better the image of the Big Black Cloud. It's also worth noting that the two were former sparring partners. The stare down, as with any home stare down, was cold. In the first round, the answer to Holmes's legitimacy was answered right away when Shavers caught him with a good shot to the head, a shot that Holmes took well as he tied Ernie up. Larry made sure to sting Ernie back with lightning fast combos from the outside. The second round doubled down. Shavers smashed Holmes with a right to which Holmes immediately took a step back to gather himself and came back with fury on Shavers. This would prove the trend for the fight. Holmes was outboxing Shavers, and whenever he was caught by a bomb, he responded accordingly. Larry was taking the best that Ernie could offer as the Black Destroyer tired. For Shavers, even he knew his only chance of winning was one big shot. Funny enough, it was Larry who almost landed that one big shot in the final round, but Shavers survived. Holmes dominated the fight, a notable feat considering Holmes was Shavers' sparring partner in the early days and had now surpassed him. Larry 
almost had a unanimous shutout over Ernie, but one of the judges gave Shavers the 10th round. It was a 12 round unanimous decision for the rapidly rising Larry Holmes, the heir apparent to the great Muhammad Ali. Holmes was one step closer to the title and another 10 steps closer to legitimacy in the eyes of boxing fans. The WBC proclaimed Norton as its champion after Spinks went against the clause to immediately defend against Ken. It was a fitting reward for Norton who many feel had been robbed throughout his career and should have already been the champion. However, there are also accusations that the WBC was bending to Don King's will here since Spinks wouldn't fight Norton who was represented by King. The title would be contested between Norton and another Don King fighter in three short months. On June 9th at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada, one could say that a form of Ali Frazier 4 happened. The two men who'd acted as the sparring partners to the great Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, respectively, squared off for the WBC Championship. Holmes was Ali's sparring partner, and Norton was Frazier's. Norton had recently been awarded the title after the WBC stripped Leon Spinks. Spinks chose to pursue a rematch with Ali over fighting the mandatory challenger Norton. This was the moment to be for both men. For Norton, it was the chance to defend the title he felt he'd been robbed of so many times against a true challenger. For Holmes, it was the title shot he needed to begin his escape from the shadow of Muhammad Ali. Both of these men needed this win, but it was only to be for one of them. The stare down was a clash of confidence. Holmes stared a hole through Norton's forehead, who returned no such acknowledging choosing to stare down at the ring as he so often did during stare downs. Neither man feared the other. The fight began with Norton starting very slow in an attempt to get Holmes to overwork himself. Holmes won four of the first five rounds, but in the sixth, Norton took his turn and began banging Larry back. The seventh saw Norton hit Holmes on the left arm, the same left arm Larry had injured in sparring. Holmes thought his arm had gone dead. In typical Joe Frazier style, Norton stormed back to even the fight up by winning five of the six rounds that followed the first five. In the twelfth, Holmes took back control with the use of his jab, but by now, the pace of the fight had worn both men down. The championship rounds were back and forth, with Holmes dominating the 13th and Norton dominating the 14th with staggering blows. The 15th round would be the deciding round. Norton started strong in the 15th, but Holmes retaliated by getting on the move and fighting through the pain stabbing away at his arms. He also had a cut that would require 11 stitches in his mouth. The two fought toe-to-toe, -to -toe, abandoning defense and battling through exhaustion. In the end, it was Holmes who managed to get the better of Norton when he staggered Ken to end the round. Big Black Cloud and the Black Hercules had put on a show for the ages. The winner by split decision was the challenger, Larry Holmes. He'd won the fight by one point. Many believed that the fight should have been either a draw or a win for Norton as he should have had the championship advantage. Surely, a rematch would answer all remaining questions, right? Unfortunately, it was never to be. A mind-baffling missed opportunity. Just like that, Ken Norton became the only man in heavyweight history to be world champion without ever winning a championship bout. The fight is also noteworthy for Sylvester Stallone sitting ringside with a notebook and observing the fight as a study in preparation for Rocky II. 
it's mind blowing how this fight didn't win fight of the year from the ring. But then again, it was another testament to the shadow that Holmes was stuck in at the hands of the old master, Muhammad Ali. Three months later, the WBA heavyweight title was back for grabs when champion Leon Neon Spinks defended the championship in a rematch against the man he'd beaten for the title, the old master, Muhammad Ali. Spinks had sacrificed his claim to being undisputed for this rematch, so a win was more than necessary. Ali had lobbied hard for the rematch after the upset of the year seven months earlier, and when he secured it, Ali boldly stated, that this would be his last fight and that he would become the only man to ever win the heavyweight title three times. On September 15th at the Superdome, the state of Louisiana hosted the Battle of New Orleans. Reigning champion and Olympic gold medalist Leon Spinks put the WBA heavyweight championship on the line against challenger Muhammad Ali. Many celebrities came to witness the fight, including Sylvester Stallone, of course. Ali's arch-rival Joe Frazier sung the national anthem for the evening. The Superdome was packed, with a record-breaking 63,350 spectators. Ali's plan was to dance and tie Spinks up, scoring on the break of the clinch as he returned to dancing. The 36-year-old challenger and former champion Ali executed the plan to perfection, dominating the novice champion overall and taking the best that Spinks had to offer, proving that he was more serious than ever for this bout. He won his title back by unanimous decision, and the image of Ali in the ring above the crowd waving and kissing the boxing world goodbye was a picture-perfect ending for the greatest. Howard Cosell serenaded Ali with this farewell. May your heart always be joyful. May your song always be sung. May you stay forever young. Howard had always believed in Muhammad. Many have been made believers of Muhammad. And there may not have been a dry eye in the Superdome that night. It was farewell to everyone's hero, even for defeated champion Leon. After the fight, Ali stated that he killed himself to get ready for Spinks and that he had nothing more left to gain or prove by fighting. Even so, he did not officially retire and held on to the title in the succeeding months, choosing to contemplate whether he'd fight again. For some, this is the last hurrah of Ali, and it's a fair point, but there are many who still believe he should have retired dating back to the thrill in Manila. Whatever the case, this truly was the last magic act of the great Ali, for there was nothing left in the tank of the greatest. Spinks would never return to such prominence as his career peaked far too soon. He fizzled out until his retirement in 1995. He may have peaked early, but his feat of becoming undisputed champion so early in his career is never to be forgotten. May the fallen champion rest in Peace. On November 7th in Greenwich, Connecticut, the boxing world lost Gene Tunney. The fighting Marine was a brilliant pugilist who was best known for his wars with Harry Greb and for being the man who ended the reign of the Manasseh Mauler, Jack Dempsey. He was a thinking boxer in a time where this was heavily looked down on but could hold his own brawling as well. Unfortunately for Tunney, he was a model citizen in a time when America was headed into the Great Depression after the post-war success of World War I. Jack Dempsey was the hero America's conscience needed, and Gene Tunney stamped his mark at the worst possible time. I consider Tunney to be the first of a lineage of heavyweight champions I've deemed 
Shadow Champs. For a more detailed overview of the Shadow Heavyweight Champions across history, check out my short chronology linked below. Rest in peace to the Fighting Marine. On November 10th at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada, reigning WBC world champion Larry Holmes defended his title against challenger Alfredo Evangelista. Alfredo had gone the distance with Ali for the title, but the word was that Ali would have easily dispatched him if it were the real Ali. The Holmes bout may have served to verify that, considering that Holmes was so close to Ali as the world could get, whether they chose to accept it or not. Larry dominated the challenger, using his jab to punish him. Holmes foiled Alfredo at every turn, leaving the challenger with a puffy face and a bloody left eye. As has been mentioned, Holmes was growing ever sick of being in Ali's shadow, who was the reigning WBA champion. Holmes yelled for Ali to either fight him or quit probably alluding to how Holmes was seeking to unify the titles and attain the lineage. Holmes made it clear that he would take on any challenger, and it was speculated he'd be facing either Jimmy Young or the winner of a Norton Shavers bout. The answer was to come in the next year, the final year of our retrospective. To conclude 1978, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Uh-oh, the titles have been splintered again. Muhammad Ali snatched the crown back from Leon Spinks, and Larry Holmes killed Ken Norton's long-awaited reign dead in the water. Contenders now had two roads to choose from in their pursuit of the title. Surely the belts will come back together again, though. Right? Leon Spinks winning the undisputed heavyweight title only eight fights into his career over the best heavyweight of the era, and maybe all time, was Ring Magazine's upset of the year. He may have lost it later in the year with Ali making history and becoming the first three-time champion, but Neon Leon was now forever etched in heavyweight history for his exploit. Said exploit would also prove to be the beginning of the lost generation and be the last sighting of an undisputed heavyweight champion for a decade. The ring's round of the year was round 15 of the first Ali Spinks title match. The ring's fight of the year was the first Ali Spinks title bout. The ring's fighter of the year was Muhammad Ali, who'd managed to rebound from his shocking loss to a relative nobody in Leon Spinks with an equally impressive avenging of his loss to become the only ever three-time heavyweight world champion up to that point. John Tate, the first of the lost generation of heavyweights to come in the 1980s, won nine bouts on the year en route to a great 1979. Jerry Cooney had eight wins and was on track to become a big name. South Africans Harry Kutsia and Kali Kanutsa continued to win on the year and would feature in the WBA's tournament the next year. On September 26th, Chuck Wepner had his final professional bout, a bout in which he lost the New Jersey State Heavyweight title by 12-round decision. He would go on to struggle with drugs a struggle that cost him a role in Rocky II as a sparring partner of Rocky's. This would have brought the Rocky franchise and Webner's life full circle. Thankfully, Webner appears to have overcome his demons in the modern day. On December 11th, George Shavalo had his last professional bout in Toronto to retain the Canadian Heavyweight Championship. He never tasted the canvas in 93 fights and had been fighting since 1956. He proved that he had the best chin in boxing in his 22 years of professional fighting and did so against the best competition the division historically had. 
On the undercard of Norton Holmes, Jimmy Young dropped a split decision against Ozzy Ocasio. It was another tick in the resume of robbery that was Jimmy Young's career, depending on who you ask that is. Also, Young found himself on the undercard of an event which he could have been main eventing with Larry Holmes if he'd received the nod against Ken Norton the previous year. Life is unfair. After the Holmes loss, Ernie Shavers won his three fights on the year by stoppage, none going past the fourth round. He'd embarked on another streak on his way back to the heavyweight championship, and 1979 would see Ernie go for broke in what would be his last chance at the strap. And he do it? Speaking of aftermaths and losing to Larry Holmes, Alfredo Evangelista would continue on throughout the 70s and 80s as a fringe contender until fizzling in the mid-80s and retiring in 1988. Thanks for the memories, sir. March 31, 1978 was Jack Johnson's 100th birthday. Johnson was the very first black heavyweight champion of the world and unapologetic in the way he lived his life spitting right in the face of contemporary racist white America. He was a trailblazer and icon of the sport for the plight of the black man and a dreadfully racist age in American history. He and Joe Lewis made it possible for Muhammad Ali to become the outspoken ambassador he'd become. Johnson, who transcended the sport in the age of Jim Crow as its biggest star, birthed the great white hope tag and hunt he will receive his own distinct coverage down the line here on boxingpedia one of the all-time greats for sure on june 22nd john tate stopped bernardo mercado in two rounds it was mercado's first loss on august 29th pinklin thomas made his debut with a split decision win on October 22nd, Mike Weaver TKO'd Bernardo Mercado in five rounds. Mercado claimed he took a thumb to the eye from a left jab, and that was why he'd gone down. 1978 was a rebounding year for the division after the missed opportunities of 77. Ali went out on a high, and Holmes was continuing to ascend. There were challengers everywhere and the new year was looking good. In a showcase that definitely elevated his WBA rank, Big John Tate stopped Dwayne Bobbick in the first round after an earlier knockdown. There looked to be another knockdown before the first knockdown, but no count was administered after the referee separated the two. Bobbick's disappointing pro career was the opposite of his amateur career, and he would only fight once more five months later, losing by stoppage on cuts. Bobbick is alive today, but unfortunately dealing with CTE, the after effects of the blows he took in the ring. John Tate, meanwhile, marched on toward potential history. In an event billed as Star Wars, broadcasted on ABC Primetime TV, two important matches took place. The undercard match was a contest between contenders the Black Hercules Ken Norton and the Black Destroyer Ernie Shavers, with the two both having been solid opponents for Muhammad Ali and Larry Holmes. It was expected that this bout would be a well-contested bout at the very least. Norton and Shavers were ranked 1 and 2 respectively by the WBC, and Norton was a 9-5 to five betting favorite. Boxing fans were also anticipating a rematch between Holmes and Norton after their spectacular fight almost a year earlier. In the first round, Ernie Shavers derailed any immediate plans of a rematch and stopped Norton after two vicious knockdowns. Referee Mills Lane stopped the bout at the request of Norton's corner after the second knockdown, and it was all over. Once again, as with Big George, Norton fell to a murderous puncher, and the boxing world would be getting a rematch. 
but of Holmes and Shavers. The main event of the night was Larry Holmes' second WBC title defense to be contested against unbeaten Puerto Rican challenger Ossie Ocasio. The fight saw Holmes finish Ossie in the seventh round after four knockdowns. The first knockdown came from a jab, a testament to the greatness of Holmes. The only other fighter I can think of that knocked someone down with a jab was Riddick Big Daddy Bo. Larry Holmes had just defended his WBC title for the second time and was looking strong in his championship reign. The boxing world now looked forward to the rematch between the now champion Larry Holmes and the man who tested his courage, his former sparring partner, Ernie Shavers. Ozzy Ocasio only fought a few more times at heavyweight but dropped down to cruiserweight and became a world champion at that level. Round 1. With Muhammad Ali gone, the WBA organized a four-man tournament for their title, of which you can see the finer details in the video dedicated to it, linked below. Big John Tate and Kali Kanutsa opened things up with Tate scoring a late TKO in the 8th after Kanutsa gassed out. On June 15th, one of the greatest sequels in a masterclass on making sequels was released in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Rocky II had big shoes to fill after the success of the first film and wasted no time doing so. The film takes place immediately after the first, showing Rocky and Apollo in the aftermath of their death match. Rocky is propelled into overnight celebrity akin to Sylvester Stallone in real life. At the request of Adrian, he retires to a life of marriage, fatherhood, and blue-collar work. Rocky also has a bad eye after the fight, further forcing his retirement. However, this doesn't work out for Rocky as he's slowly drawn back to the boxing ring as financial problems arise after he blows his fortune from the Apollo fight. Speaking of the champion. Apollo has a change of heart from the end of the original film, now enraged that Rocky took him the distance. Apollo spins the movie trying to goad Rocky out of retirement for a rematch so that he can show how the fight really would have gone had he taken it seriously. The goading finally pulls Rocky out of retirement after a new show in which Apollo calls Rocky a coward while showing off his skill. Choosing to defend his manhood, Rocky and Mickey set out to prepare for a rematch with Creed, much to Adrian's disappointment. Rocky and Adrian also learn that they're having a baby and the overall stress of life comes down hard on them both as Rocky struggles to focus in training and Adrian falls into a coma after premature birth after Pauly pushes things too far one day at the pet shop, a job Adrian had to return to to help alleviate the financial burden. Stallone's acting chops really show through in the hospital as Rocky cries and begs for Adrian to make it. She does make it, and Rocky feels more motivated than ever to win after Adrian finally provides her support. But is it too late with the fight drawing near? Rocky even manages to master fighting right-handed as a means of protecting his bad eye. On fight night, Rocky is badly outclassed by Apollo and will need a knockout for the win. Apollo's pride ultimately costs him the title as he fights desperately for the knockout, refusing to allow Rocky to go the distance again. Rocky rallies in the final round after switching back to Southpaw and floors Creed and himself. Whoever stands up first wins the championship and it's a really dramatic affair Rocky makes it to his feet and Creed slumps back to the canvas, suffering his first ever professional loss. Rocky Balboa is the new heavyweight champion of the world and ends the movie with arguably the most famous line in the series. Yo, Adrian! Adrian! 
This was the last Rocky movie released in the 70s, as the next two followed in the 80s. Sylvester Stallone and company had done it again. Rocky II is a certified classic and the closest in tone to the original. In fact, it's arguably better than the original. On June 22nd at MSG in New York, Larry Holmes defended the WBC Heavyweight Championship of the World against number eight ranked challenger Mike Hercules Weaver. Weaver wasn't expected to be much of a challenge for Larry, but he proved formidable and managed to have the crowd behind him. The two spent the fight pounding away at one another, all leading to the 11th where Holmes dropped Weaver with an uppercut that contained all of Holmes' will. Weaver survived, but would be stopped in the 12th when Holmes overwhelmed him and the referee had seen enough. It was the third defense for Holmes and another testament to how entertaining a champion he was. Weaver put on a great showing, but just wasn't enough for the champion. Weaver's crowning moment would come the next year against John Tate in a late fight shocker. Larry and Mike would also have a rematch 21 years later in Biloxi, Mississippi, a match that would see Holmes stop Weaver again, this time in the sixth round. Holmes was 51, Weaver was 49. If I'm not mistaken, we're due for Holmes Weaver 3 this year, since they seem to like fighting 21 years apart. Round 2. On the other end of the bracket, former undisputed champion Leon Spinks returned to the ring for the first time since the Ali duology against South African contender Harry Kutsia. It had been nine months since Spinks lost the WBA title to Ali. Now he was out to regain it. Rather shockingly, Kutsia dwarfed the former champion with three knockdowns in the opening round to secure the TKO victory and move on to the finale against Big John Tate. Spinks wouldn't fight again until the opening of the new decade. With this, the finale was set to be determined between the two undefeated young bucks Kusia and Tate. Who's the WBA champion? Muhammad Ali held on to the title after winning it for an unprecedented third time, cherishing his time as a global icon. Bob Arum was working to get Ali to retire so that he could promote a bout for the WBA title and advance the division. Arum paid Ali $300,000 to get the reluctant champion to officially retire so that the title could be back in action. In June, Ali sent an official letter of retirement to the WBA and on July 27th, the feat was accomplished and a long sought bout between the WBA's top contenders was finally set in stone. History was repeating itself, or rather rhyming. Just as the WBA had sought to replace Ali with an eight-man eliminator series back in 1967 when the champion was sent into exile, it was doing so again now with a four-man elimination tournament at Ali's retirement. The bionic hand, Harry Kutsia, Big John Tate, Kali Kanutsa and Olympic champion Leon Neon Spinks were the contestants. Larry Holmes, meanwhile, was set out to reunify the titles, something he would unfortunately never achieve. Five months, give or take, since Norton was blasted by Ernie Shavers, he returned to the ring against Scott Ledoux. Ledoux, too, had lost his last bout, a 10-round split decision to Ron Lyle. The bout would serve to showcase the inevitable truth that Norton was now past his best. A thumb to the eye in the eighth only made things worse for Norton, as Ledoux rallied and dropped Norton in the final round. When the dust settled, the fight was declared a draw, the only draw, of Norton's career. One month later, the Black Hercules announced his retirement in the aftermath of his trainer Bob Byron passing away stating he couldn't go on without him. Norton was so disappointed in his performance, however, that he elected to return to boxing in 1980. Mike Weaver hopped on the comeback trail three months to the day since losing a gallant war with Larry Holmes. 
It was a baptism, as we were dropped Terrell four times, once in the first, another in the third, and two final times in the fourth. Looking good there, Hercules. It was on, again, but this time, it was for the WBC Heavyweight Championship. Larry Holmes and Ernie Shavers were ready to get it on again, but was it to be a repeat of their bout from the previous year? Remember that Holmes outright dominated the action against Shavers in a 12-round test of courage. Bundini Brown attended the press conference and barked on behalf of the Big Black Cloud. And I bring that up to reference that even in his retirement, Ali's shadow still lingered over the sweet science. Holmes was the champion, but still lived as if he were a fighter on the come-up, fighting tooth and nail for everything he had. He stayed in bad hotels and was mistaken for others in public for autographs. Larry was criminally underrated and overlooked, but it worked in his favor as it kept him hungry. Anyone would have been in that position coming off the hills of the Ali reign, but you can't blame Holmes for being bitter to an extent, especially considering that years later, Mike Tyson would get the adoration Holmes had rightfully earned during his reign. Back to the rematch with Shavers. Holmes dominated the first six rounds in similar fashion to the first fight, but never underestimate the true chance of a puncher. Shavers had proved his puncher's chance was the best of all against Ken Norton, and when he decked Holmes with a killer right in the seventh round, it appeared it had all come crashing down for the young champion. Then, out of nowhere, Larry revived and rose to his feet as if he were a man returning to life from his grave. It brings to mind how Tyson Fury rose against the Wilder knockdown. Even more impressive was the fact that Holmes recovered well enough to take back control over the action leading into the 11th, where he was badly battering Shavers. The referee stepped in to save Ernie, and Larry had once again proven that he was the real deal. This win was arguably even more impressive than the first. It was the fourth title defense for Larry Holmes and still just the beginning of his dominance over the division. The WBA's tournament to crown a new champion after Ali vacated the title was to conclude with a culturally significant bout as black American Big John Tate took on white South African, the Boxburg bomber, Harry Kutsia. The event took place at Loftus Versfeld Stadium in Pretoria, Gauteng, South Africa, a pretty big deal considering this was during the apartheid era. This bout was so badly desired by South Africa, who so desperately wanted a homegrown champion, that the government finally allowed its black citizens into the venue to sit among its white citizens. It drew the biggest boxing crowd in over 50 years. The fight was nothing special seeing Tate win an uneventful 15-round unanimous decision. What was significant was the effect that the bout had on South Africa. The first match to change the face of apartheid in South Africa was the 1973 bout between Bob Foster and Pierre Fury. While white South Africans backed Harry, black South Africans backed Tate. This was all in spite of the fact that Harry opposed apartheid. Black citizens held no ill will toward Harry, but they just couldn't bring themselves to cheer someone white after what their government had done to them. This was the last heavyweight bout of notoriety in the 1970s, a fitting way to end the decade heading into the 1980s. At the conclusion of 1979 and the 1970s as a whole, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Well, no unification. John Tate won the tournament for the WBA crown and Larry Holmes continued strong in defending the WBC strap. Contenders continued lining up and hopefully the two champs fight in the new decade. Hopefully. 
Harry could see a blasting Neon Leon, the former undisputed heavyweight champion, and the latter's return to the ring since the Ali duology is the upset of the year. A notable win despite Kusia failing to capture the WBA title in the tournament finale. The ring's round of the year was not a heavyweight honor, but for this chronology, it has to go to round eight of the Holmes Shavers title bout. Holmes rebounded from being knocked down in the last round to stagger Ernie, but failed to put Ernie away. The ring did not award fight of the year to the heavyweight division, but if there had to be one for the honor, it would have to be the exciting rematch between Larry Holmes and Ernie Shavers. The ring's fighter of the year, again, was not awarded to a heavyweight, but Larry Holmes easily takes the cake for our retrospective. On February 16th, Greg Page made his debut with a second round knockout win. On October 30th, Tim Witherspoon debuted with an opening round TKO victory. In both men's final bout of the 70s, Mike Weaver defended the USBA title in a 12 round unanimous decision win over Scott LaRue. Weaver continued ascending since the loss to Holmes and would head into 1980 to challenge Big John Tate for the WBA title. You don't want to miss that one. Jimmy Young and Ozzy Ocasio got it on again on January 27th, and Ocasio once again got the win. This time, it was a unanimous decision. The bout took place on the same grounds that Young banished George Foreman into retirement. Later, on September 28th, Young fought up-and-coming Young Lion Michael Dynamite Dokes, dropping a unanimous decision. He fought once more in the 70s, before acting as a rite of passage of sorts for upcoming 80s contenders in the next decade. He retired on September 22nd, 1990. For the first time since 1959, Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, and George Foreman weren't featured on any card. They would all return in the 1980s to varying success. Ali would be dangerously exposed. Frazier would bode well enough as a shell of himself, and Foreman would execute the greatest comeback in boxing history. Muhammad Ali had an exhibition against Denver Broncos defensive end Lao Lozado. The bout went eight full rounds and was called a draw. Hopes of heavyweight unification died in November, and the next year would see six title fights, four for the WBC title and two for the WBA title. No one could reach a deal, a sad reality that we're still burdened by today. Speaking of splinter titles, Ernie Shavers pursued Larry Holmes under the WBC umbrella in 1979 and fell short of becoming champ. But what if he were to join the WBA tournament? He was ranked second after all. If Shavers elects to pursue the WBA title, Perhaps this timeline would be discussing how the Black Destroyer finally managed to become heavyweight champion. The Holmes rematch wound up being Ernie's last fight in the 70s, and the 80s would see him fluctuate between borderline contender and journeyman. He had a four-year hiatus from 1983 to 1987, where he would fight only once in 87, before returning in 1995 to fight twice and retire for good. The 1970s began with the title splintered and ended in the same way. The issue was only made worse by the boxing world growing sick and tired of the WBC and WBA's monopoly of sorts on the sport. By the end of the 80s, two more sanctioned bodies, the International Boxing Federation or IBF and the World Boxing Organization or WBO would be in the boxing sweepstakes with titles of their own. This would lead to the death of the dream match era of boxing that had gone back to the sport's inception. To this day, politics, sanctioning bodies, money, and boxer camps shape whether certain fights will take place. Whereas it was looked down upon to duck an opponent back then, today it's a part of the sport. As of my writing this, Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua are scheduled to fight in Israel on August 14th. 
of 2021 to unify the heavyweight championship. It will be the first time we've had an undisputed heavyweight champion since Lennox Lewis 20 years ago. Ah, there's an audible on the play. Deontay Wilder all of a sudden wants to enforce the rematch now when the fight of the decade was finally slated to happen. Their third bout will take place on July 24th of 2021 in Las Vegas. Or so we thought, as the fight has been postponed to October 9th due to Fury's camp having an outbreak in the camp. Fury won the explosive affair, surviving two knockdowns and dishing out three knockdowns of his own, the last one winning him the fight. At the conclusion of the 1970s, the landscape of the heavyweight division had changed drastically. The three pillars of the division, Ali, Frazier, and Foreman, had hung up the gloves. The heavyweight championship was splintered to begin the decade and was splintered exiting the decade. The lineage was disrupted by Ali's retirement after he'd beaten Spinks to become a historical three-time heavyweight champ. But Larry Holmes looked to be well on his way to picking up the lineage through his dominance of the division. If I had to award a round of the decade for the heavyweights, it would have to go to rounds four and five of the Foreman Lyle fight from 1976. Those guys were trying to kill one another in there, and it was a true test of wills. As for fight of the decade, the answer for me has to be a two-way tie between the fight of the century and the thriller in Manila. Ali and Frazier had the kind of rivalry we'll probably never see again, similar to the lightning caught in the bottle in the world of wrestling that was Stone Cold Steve Austin against The Rock. Ring Magazine awarded Roberto Duran as fighter of the decade, but if we had to give the title to a heavyweight, most wouldn't hesitate to give it to Muhammad Ali. He returned from exile and suffered some big losses, redeemed said losses, became champion again in the same manner that he did a decade earlier in the 60s, defended the title against the best competition, and regained the title for a then unprecedented third time. All this while working with eroded skills and being past his best as the years passed. However, unfortunately enough, it wasn't over yet for the fighter who proved he was the greatest. He was about to attempt to become champion for an impossible fourth time against the man who was his sparring partner for a good deal of the decade. This fight's significance to be included in this chronology despite not taking place in the 70s is for a variety of reasons. Holmes was the best champion since Ali and picked up the reins from Ali in 1979. Holmes was Ali's sparring partner. Holmes was the reigning WBC champion. But most important of them all, Ali retired as the lineal champion, leaving the lineage splintered. Holmes was already deep in the shadow of Ali in the eyes and hearts of boxing fans and hadn't managed to unify the heavyweight championship. The opportunity came for Holmes when Ali announced he was coming back for the title and on July 17th, the two signed to fight on October 2nd. The Easton assassin readied himself to stake claim to one piece of the fragmented crown. On October 2nd of 1980, at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada, undefeated WBC champion Larry Holmes squared off against his idol, the man he'd practically lived with and under to become the dominant champion he was, Ahmed Ali. The fight was a heartbreaker. People wanted so badly to believe Ali was still the man they remembered, even choosing him to decision Holmes, but it wasn't reality. Ali had already shown signs of waning health in the last days of the 70s. So to see him against the prime Holmes, 
when he had zero business in the ring was the equivalent of watching a one-legged man in an ass-kicking competition. Holmes easily outboxed and battered Ali before the fight was stopped at the end of the 10th by Ali's trainer, Angelo Dundee. Larry Holmes was the new lineal champion and would go on to be one of the greatest champions of all time. As finished as Ali should have been, sadly, it wasn't the end. He'd fight one more time a year later before finally hanging up the gloves for good. Going back to 1977 after the bout with Ernie Shavers, Ali's health concerns called for his retirement, yet these pleas by Dr. Ferdy Pacheco were ignored and Ali's deterioration under Parkinson's was expedited. With the conclusion of the bout between Ali and Holmes, the 70s was done. The arguable two best fighters from the decade put the stamp on the ballot. The 80s would turn out to be an era of lost and wasted talent often referred to as the lost generation. For the full timeline of Larry Holmes in the 1980s lost generation, the link to both documentaries are in the description. If I had to rank the top 10 fighters from the 70s, bottom to top, it would go Joe Bugner, Jerry Quarry, Jimmy Young, Ron Lyle, Ernie Shavers, Ken Norton, Larry Holmes, Joe Frazier, George Foreman, and Muhammad Ali. On the note of ranking, if I had to rank the years of the 70s from least to most exciting, it would go 72, 70, 71, 79, 77, 78, 76, 73, 74, and 75. The top three years are interchangeable for the number one spot as the division was white hot, must see action. I'd like to personally thank the fallen warriors of the 70s who stamped history and set an unprecedented bar on the sport. Bob Foster, Oscar Bonavina, Irish Jerry Quarry, Ron Lyle, Jimmy Ellis, Neon Leon Spinks, Jimmy Young, the Gentleman of Boxing, Floyd Patterson. The Black Destroyer, Ernie Shavers. The Black Hercules, Ken Norton. Charles, Sonny Liston. Smokin' Joe Frazier. And the Louisville Lip. The greatest of all times, Muhammad Ali. A thank you as well to the living legends of the golden era of heavyweight boxing. The Bay and Bleeder in real life, Rocky Chuck Webner, Ozzy Joe Buckner, George Boom Boom Shavalo, Big George Foreman, and the Big Black Cloud, the Eastern Assassin, Larry Holmes. Now you all know me, this channel is the headcanon central of the internet, and that means I've got to do a what if on Sonny Liston in the 70s division. This, along with another project I'm working on that will pit the best of the 70s and the 90s against one another in a massive heavyweight tournament to find an undisputed champ, is coming in the future. I'd also like to thank you all for your patience. This video took forever to make and there was a point where I was almost done with it and all of my progress was erased due to my own folly. I had to start from the top, but I took it for what it was and feel I was able to make this video better because of it. I hope you all enjoyed this retrospective look back into the golden age of heavyweight boxing, and I'll see you next time. I'd also like to take the time to thank the wonderful individuals who post boxing footage and full matches on YouTube. Thanks for everything. This has been The Charles Jackson. Peace.